Welcome to Raging Bullets, a DC Comics fan podcast, episode 384. Welcome to Raging Bullets, I'm Sean Whalen, Dr. Norge, and joined as always by my co-host, Red Lantern, Jim... <laughs> How's it going, eh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. This episode, we're going to talk about Red Lantern Supergirl. Uh, Supergirl issue number 28. Uh, Green Lantern issues 28 and 29. And the Red Lantern flipbook side, which was also Red Lantern's number 28 as well. And we talk about Superman Wonder Woman number 6. At the end of the episode, we're going to have some information about our show contest, which we announced last episode, and I want to put that on every episode leading up to it. But I uh, want everyone to have a chance to participate. Eight years of Raging Bullets uh, coming up at the end of this month. So We are proud members of the Comics Podcast Network and the League of Comic Book Podcasts. Once again, sponsoring us this episode is DCBService.com and InStockTrades.com. Over at DCBService.com, I want to shout out the Batman Black and White Harley Quinn 2nd Edition statue. This is designed by Bruce Tim and sculpted by John Matthews, and it is gorgeous. Uh, I'm a big fan of these black and white statues, and I jumped on the bandwagon a little late with these, and this is what I'm eyeing. Uh, I, I'm not collecting all of them, but what I'm trying to do is get like select pieces that I just think are really cool, and this is one I think I'm going to grab. Uh, the reason why I'm shouting it out is I just wanted to point out that DCBService.com for pre-ordering not only do they do comics, they do all the statues, trade paperbacks, action figures. So if you're a collector, as, as a lot of us are, of the swag that goes along with comics, it's a great opportunity to browse through DCBService.com, get everything at a discount, because this is a $79.95 statue, 32% off, only fifty-four thirty-seven. So it's great that you can even get discounts on those type of items and lock it in from DCBService.com and have it shipped with your regular comic order. So I just want to remind everyone that they have that. Remember that if you link your digital comic accounts to DCBService.com, you earn 5% of those purchases towards your DCB service order. So remember, DCBService.com is your pre-order source. Over at InStockTrades.com, we talk on this episode about Wonder Woman. Actually, uh, we talk about the Superman Wonder Woman comic. But in there, we talk about just how much we're enjoying the character of Wonder Woman in the New 52. And they have Wonder Woman's hardcover, Volume 4, War. From the New 52, it's Brian Azzarello, Cliff Chang, and various others. 144 page count, $22.99 regularly, 50% off, only eleven forty nine. InStockTrades.com is just a wonderful source for if you're looking for trades and hardcovers. So wanted to shout them out and thank both of those sites for supporting our show. Red Lantern Jim, what kind of a podcast are we? Raging Bullets is a spoiler podcast. We go in-depth into plot lines, story twists, and whatnot of the comics we're discussing on the show. So if you haven't read the books, you may want to come back later so you can better enjoy the show. I would love you to read, like, Shakespeare in that voice. And, like, see how long you could hold out. <laughs> We're a <dull> thought pal. <laughs> <laughs> you know, with all those uh, little twists and turns and things like that in it. <laughs> that hurt my throat. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's why I kind of like to see how long, how long you could handle that. Well, this is good. We won't record again until next week, so you'll have, like, a week to recover. You can, like, nurse that voice. And <laughs> Let's talk some comics. Come on, Screel. Let's pay these plutonian beam makers a visit. Our first chat this episode is going to be on Supergirl number 28. Tony Bedard is the writer. Yildire, Yildire Sinar. It's Y-I-L-D-I-R-A-Y. I know I butchered that. C-I-N-A-R on pencils, and I love the artwork, so I really want to get that right. Ray McCarthy on ink, Stan Brown colorist, Rob Lay letterer, Giuseppe Camicoli and Cam Smith with Brown on the cover, Ricky Purden editor, Eddie Berganza group editor. And uh, definitely want to apologize for any name butchery there. This is a big storyline. Uh, we've got Supergirl getting a Red Lantern ring. This is great because it goes back to the history of this book. This has been a character who's been angry about so much. She's been angry about what happened to her planet. It's really played off of the fact that she was much older than Cal 
when this all went down. So she has a deep emotional connection to everything that's happening. But not only had that happened to her, she encounters her cousin, and, and the question is, is it really her cousin in her mind? Understandably so. She's on this planet where so many horrible things have happened to her, including a recent love, who wound up being someone that promised her the ability to bring back her family, her home planet, and everything, and turned out to be uh, a homicidal maniac, for lack of a better term, that was going to destroy everything in order to accomplish that, including putting her in a position where she had to let what happened to her planet continue, making the ultimate sacrifice. So emotionally, this is a pretty angry person from the get-go. Now it's only increased as the storyline went on, in a way that makes sense. Uh, you know, emotionally, she hasn't had time to go through any form of healing process from the recent events in the Krypton crossover. And when Lobo shows up and this fight just continues now, she's already ready to unleash. Uh, I get it. And oh God, it, yeah. it totally makes sense. And I love this. I didn't see it coming. And I really love the direction. Oh, yeah. This was, you know, one, you talk about the character and just rage and the concept of rage and what she's been through. It's not just, oh, you know, she's upset about her planet. No, every single time she's got that glimmer of happiness. She's got that moment that, hey, this could work out nice for me. It flips the switch. Every person that, you know, she pretty much thinks, you know, is going to be there for her is going to be there to help her, ends up in some way, shape, or form appearing like they're betraying her or actually betraying her. So she's got you know trust issues. She's got pain issues. She's got survivor's guilt. She's got the fact that she had this chance to save her planet, to save her family, to save everybody she knows and loves, and she had to choose, no, I'm going to let them die. No, and then I'm going to actually end them. You know, And this add on to it. It's going to get to that boiling point. And I love the fact that she gets to the point and Lobo's sitting there going, hey, I'm going to get her so she's just swinging wildly and get, he wants her, you know, raged out. She, he wants her rage up because so she's not thinking. It's, you know, all part of his end game, all part of his plan, but it kind of backfires on him big time. Now, what do you think about this whole Lobo storyline? Uh, it's, it's been going on throughout the comics. Uh, we've got a new Lobo who's going after the more traditional Lobo, who in his mind is an imposter, which I'm not entirely sure I believe is the case. Either way, I really like this storyline. I'm enjoying what's going on. I want to see what's going on with this character. But are you, how are you with that? Do you like that there's a new Lobo? Do you like that there's two of them running I around? Did. I definitely 100% dig it. Yeah, you know, I, I was never a really huge Lobo fan in the past, so for them to tweak things and change it around, I'm okay with it. And I remember when they first introduced this guy, I was thinking we were getting a Lobo, a young Lobo story. And then you find out, no, this is Lobo, and he's saying the other guy's an imposter, or the other guy's a clone, or maybe he's a clone. And it's you get that who's real, who's fake, and in the end, Will it matter? These, you know, I'm looking forward to when these two meet up. I want to see that fight. I hope it's in a title. I hope we get to actually see it play out. And I hope they give them some time to just let it go and let it build and let it fester. Give us a really cool, you know, fight sequence between the two Lobos. Because you know there can be only one. We see during this Lobo fight uh, someone lurking in the shadows. And as the fight continues on, from... Kara's internal dialogue, we really see what she's going through here. This is a guy who she's taken out multiple times. Kara's also not afraid to kill. What do you feel about that? Like, she's very different in her stance on should or shouldn't. I'm not saying, now, being clear, she's not going around snapping heads and, you know, snapping necks and, you know, breaking heads and those type of things. I, I like that. But she doesn't have the same morality stance that Clark does. What are your feelings? Oh, definitely. You know, it, again, it fits the character. You know, this is who she is. This is where she's coming from. I kind of equate it to what we get from uh, Wonder Woman. Mm -hmm. There's still that, you know, especially because Kara doesn't, you know, she wasn't a uh, Kansas farm boy. She wasn't raised with that type of mindset and just the, you know, the way to look at the humans and look at us. She doesn't look down on people. But, you know, she's not a human. She's not going to have that type of, you know, 
I don't want to say humanity because she's a good person. And, you know, at the core of her being, she's a good person. She's not going to go after, you know, the weak person and knock him down just for fun of it or anything like that. But she doesn't have that that code of conduct. And yeah. she shouldn't have that because she's Kryptonian. She's going to look at life how they looked at it. And plus, again, add to the fact that she's got all this anger issues. And she's got all this, you know, this personal drama that, you know, she really, you know, she really needs a friend. She really needs a true and honest friend that she can have these discussions with, that she can have a positive way, you know, to out, you know, to outpour emotions. I dare I say it, she needs, you know, to have like a shrink or something and just have her sit down and talk to her and, you know, talk things over. Do you think there's any part of her that's subconsciously aware that her dad's cyborg Superman? I'm not I saying, don't think so. I mean, I'm saying like deep, deep down, like where she couldn't bring it to the surface. Because it was funny when she was going through those images of, you know what I'm sick and tired of? People acting like they know me. Like they only want what's best for me. And you look through the, the picture stance and, and how it relates back to her father and Cyborg Superman and her love. I don't know. I mean, it's just... Um, she, she's had anger issues for a lot of her life. I like this because she's not whiny. There's a huge difference between understanding and finding interesting the anger of somebody that can be, it can evolve over time. And making somebody so whiny to the point that they're unlikable. I like her. I think you're right. She needs some help. Uh, I always liked in the previous continuity when she, you mentioned Wonder Woman and the link there. When she went to Themyscira and she was trained there. I thought that was a cool twist in the storyline. We don't have that place, though, in this. Uh, but the relationship with Wonder Woman is something I wouldn't mind seeing as she continues to evolve. It'd be great to see her, you know, we see Wonder Woman in her own book doing a lot of training. It'd be nice to see Kara kind of get involved in that on some level as a way to kind of hone the warrior side of her. Uh, or... You know, what's going to happen with her and Guy Gardner and all this? You know, is there going to be an opportunity for Guy Gardner to maybe be that person? Because he's been there before. I don't know. Um, it's it's very interesting. I like this aspect of the storyline, though, as we see it gradually build to that. Even when her former friend and roommate has a new roommate and realizing that I don't have a home anymore. I don't have a place where I can kind of just be myself and unwind and talk to somebody about the things that are at my core root. And I don't know, I just, this storyline coming out of a character that's been developed for 28 issues and it's not out of left field. That's what's really unique. Sometimes you, you know, you'll do stuff like this for shock value and you're like, that's really cool. But like, <laughs> what has led this character to getting this? It's really clear with Kara. <laughs> And it's funny that the notion of Guy Gardner being the anger management person for her. But, and honestly, yeah, I see what you're saying, how this process could go through it. And well, Guy is, you know, a different type of Red Lantern. There is a different code of rage and that goes through. So it'd be interesting to see how her period as a Red Lantern would help her out. I, Ideally, I would love to see her and Wonder Woman train. Mm -hmm. And even if... Themyscira became her home away from home, you know, because we've seen Diana return there a couple times and it's, you know, abandoned, it's emptied, and I could see that be kind of something that would appeal to Kara about just being away from everybody, being away from ev everything and anything, and just having a place there. So I think that could actually do her a world of good. Yeah. It's interesting to question, like, where she goes. And the Guy Gardner thing, you know what, here's what makes me think of that. Totally agreeing with you chuckling and why you are, because we know who Guy is. But one of the things that are charming about Guy and that we like about him as a character is the times that he does step up. You know, when you least expect it and he shows you an emotional side, he shows you that caring side. It makes you realize that in situations like this, he's actually not a bad guy to call on. Because he will, like, be able to relate in a way that, like, Superman wouldn't be able to. Superman would not be able to relate to what she's going through. He could be sympathetic, he could listen, offer advice, but he can't come from the same perspective that she is. Whereas a guy Gardner can understand this. 
And there's something to that. Diana could understand this. Oh, so, definitely. You, you know, she understands anger and rage and after losing her people and stuff like that. So, and I think that's where Superman would rely on her. I can't wait. We're going to talk later about the relationship with Superman and Wonder Woman. I can't wait because I think it's very relevant to this discussion yeah. because uh, it's one of the nice things about there being such a rich character tapestry that's gradually being introduced uh, back into the New 52 is you get to take a look at stuff like this and how these characters relate and interact. Uh, and it, one of the reasons we give, you know, we want to give full credit and we're always apologetic to butchering of names oh, yeah. for the creative team is very evident on the page that where Kara gets her ring. I got to say, I absolutely loved this page down from penciling, inking, coloring, the full creative team, all, you know, lettering as well, full creative team working together here. This made some really cool imagery. You know, I absolutely love just where it first swoops in and you get that close up of just, you know, the red bathing light on her. So everything's starting to get the red accents and then just the bright hint of the blue of her eyes. But it has those red accents kind of like mm -hmm. eyeliner type. And it was like, wow, I'm sitting there. I stare at the page, you know, and just say, dang, this is awesome. This is, you know, a really cool moment. And, you know, it's. You know, first read through my art read through, follow up read throughs, all of it, and it's just that great parts where it's like Karazarel of Krypton. You have great rage in your heart. You belong to the Red Lantern Corps, and just that process of it's not a do you accept? Will you join? It's you belong. There's just such pure rage in her heart that this moment it's a perfect connection. I was like, dang, that's awesome. I liked the pages before that, too, leading up to it, where we see her gradually just losing it during the fight, where she's like, enough is enough already. You know, I've, I've thrown everything but the kitchen sink at this guy, and every time I think I'm safe, every time I think I'm done, I can kick back, relax, think, sort out my emotions. You know, she hasn't had a chance to do that. You have a sense of home. You know, we we take it for granted when we see these characters a lot of times. Imagine we were like the last peop one of the last people left from our planet. You know, and our next closest kin is somebody that's a complete and utter stranger. How do you connect? How do you feel like you belong? I mean, she's an everybody else is an alien to her. So she's on a world where everybody's alien. Yeah. See, I buy it was when I was a kid, I always used to think about, you know, stuff like this. And then as I grew older, you know, I'd, I'd sit there and I'd read a story. And it would always get me back to the same thought process of why Superman always stayed on Earth. Now, granted, he's got this superhuman power. It's his adopted world, yada, da, yada, da, all those. And that's true and good stories and it makes for a good comic. But part of me always thought that if I was Superman, I would leave Earth for a planet that, you know, had more beings like me or had a different lifestyle. Because you think about it, just how fragile and how you know weak humans are. If you're not going to conquer us, can you truly live among us? Can you truly be one of us where every couple minutes, hey, save us here. Hey, save us here. Hey, do this. I've got all this power, but I'm not going to conquer. Well, you go to a place where some people have an equal power level to you. Or people where you're not the outstanding standout, where you're not this this uh, superhuman being. You're one of everybody else. Earth's home to him. Earth is home to him. Uh, very different than Kara. Everything you just said you could put on Kara, you can't put on Clark. And I notice I said Clark. Clark Kent. He was raised by the Kents. This is home to him. He didn't know until he got to a certain age that he was an alien or adopted. And actually, I relate to that heavily because I didn't know I was adopted until I hit a certain age. So, you know, you, you have a foundation where there's a sense of who your parents are. There's a sense of home. Uh, he didn't realize till much later that he was a Kryptonian, that he had other parents, things like that. So really, the Kent Farm and Smallville and all that is home. So to just leave and go somewhere else to find other beings like you, these are beings like him in the way that he was raised. So it's a very different, he happens to have superpowers, he happens to have been adopted from another planet, but the way he was raised and the parentage has made him human. I mean, in the sense of the emotional humanity. Actually, your use of humanity earlier, where then you like corrected yourself and talked about being a good person, that type of thing. When we think of humanity, we think of the, you know, the good qualities 
you know, what we would consider to be ideal qualities that make somebody a, an active part of human society. And that's what we tend to use that label, (laughs) you know, as uh, being human. But that's why Clark wouldn't do it. So it's funny, those things that you thought about with Clark, I do think, though, you can sit there and say to yourself, this is why Kara feels the way that she is. And and is this the right place for her? So there's a relevance to that where you could transfer that and paste it on Kara. Now, all of a sudden, the question becomes really valid. Like, why would she stay? Is it her cousin? Uh, and b- the other problem is flipping back. Where do you go where you don't feel like an alien? Yeah, exactly. I, I don't know the answer to that. I would say, well, one with the Red Lantern, with getting the ring, and you know, we see later on she starts to get, you know, some of her, you know, fa- you know her facilities in order, and she, you know, we start she'll become more of the current Red Lanterns how they are. But yeah. there is, you know, an opening for her. There, she's going to be exposed to other races and other beings. And, you know, eventually I'm assuming she's going to lose the ring somehow, you know, and she'll be back to being a Kryptonian. And, you know, this could be an opening for her to travel the universe. This would be, she would be a great way to do a intergalactic story where she's out traveling the stars, where she's out seeing the sights and learning these other races and these other beings. And, you know, um, the, that the uh, Captain uh, Comet, the story that had that the state, that uh, that uh, giant space station city, you know, that kind of uh, story, but put her in it instead of somebody else. You know, just have her on an intergalactic space station learning and living and just being out there among the stars. Yeah, yeah. So I don't know. I, I it's an it's an interesting conundrum with the character and I like that though because there's something that feels real about it. Things happen in life a lot of times that are out of your control. And you strive to make sense of them and to find your place in them. And sometimes it does cause people to move and leave. Sometimes it causes them to reevaluate and find a way to make it work. And uh, we as humans, we see that all the time. Take it one step further when you're somebody who feels um, completely disenfranchised because you really aren't one of them. I mean, I think we as comic fans, it's one of the reasons why we like comics a lot of times. In life, we all have times in our life where we feel disenfranchised, left out. Um, We're not a part of something. We've all been there, usually many times. (laughs) You know, and, and it's that sense of belonging that hopefully comes at some point in time that grounds you. She doesn't have that. And there's something to be learned by it. I love her story. I'm really digging this book a lot. It's one that I tend to forget how much I enjoy because there are times where Supergirl, because I'm reading other titles, I'll sometimes get two or three issues behind on Supergirl. But when I catch up with it, I always found myself really enjoying her story And I've really enjoyed her book since the beginning of the New 52. She's been a character that her revamp, uh, I think, took all of the elements that I really liked about her before the New 52 and left out a lot of the stuff that I didn't. Because there were runs of hers that I really, you know, it was kind of like, you know, she's a little too whiny or a little too bitter all the time. This is different, and I I can't really, I mean, I think our conversation's kind of alluded to it, but I can't really label it exactly. It just feels different to me. I've never had a point with this girl where I felt like she was unlikable, whereas the previous one, there were stages where I did. And and I always reference the uh, Jamal Eigel Sterling Gates run on the book as being one that evolved her into somebody who was really likable, didn't throw out the window everything that happened to her before, And I think this has looked to the best of the previous Supergirl, while at the same time having to take her back a few steps from where Gates and Igel were with her because of the fact that we're dealing with her from ground zero. But they've never made her unlikable. And there's something important to me about that with this book. It's why I've enjoyed her story so much. I don't know if you felt the same way, though. No, as you're talking, I'm nodding my head. You know, for me, it seemed like uh, this, the New 52 was great for Supergirl and that we've got all that stuff. Because I'm in the same boat as you with uh, Gates and Eigel. You know, Supergirl was just absolutely wonderful. And that was always my benchmark, yeah. you know, for these Supergirl stories. Like, how does it compare to the that character? How does it compare to that character that I really enjoyed? And I and was like, man, this is awesome. You know, Supergirl's great. You know, how does, you know, she compare? And this is a character that I could see 
in that same you know in that same in that same way i have that same feeling towards her i've got that same like you know coolness of the character and growth and again she's a different a little bit different pattern and i love the fact that she keeps saying she never seemed whiny because this supergirl dealt with a lot of similar problems that the other one did but the way she handled it here the way it was presented it didn't give me that it didn't rub me the wrong way i could understand why she was feeling the way why she was reacting the same way but i could also see that hero that I was like, man, she's a cool hero. There's a lot, you know, she's got a lot of, you know, heart in her. And I, you know, I could see that. And, you know, her, you know, picking the right path, going with the harder road travel as opposed to going the easy route. And just, you know, it's that point where she's worthy of the mantle of the House of L. She's worthy of that. She's worthy of being called a super. And I think that, to me, you know, seeing how much of a Superman fan I am and how much I think I always I needed that in the character. And I always had that throughout her life. Even when she has these down points, I can understand it. And I can get it. You know, the killing, the fact that she will take a life if she needs to. But it's not arbitrary. It's not just a, eh, yeah, yeah. I might as well kill this thing. No, there's you know, life is sacred to her. And you see that. But. She doesn't. She's not Clark, and I like. You need to have that difference, and I like that difference, and it makes sense. The distinction you mentioned um, with it being arbitrary. If it was arbitrary, I'd have major issues. You know, I don't want to see Rambo Supergirl. <laughs> you know what I mean? Where it's like she walks in every issue, and her her way of dealing with mass numbers is let's snap next. I mean, I, just, I don't want well, to. Let's see use that. the heat vision and cut them all in yeah, half. Yeah, I don't yeah. want that either. <laughs> and, you know, that's uh, if I saw a villain do that, I'd be okay with it. You know, what I mean, and I'd be like, oh wow, this is a very impressive way to build a villain. I don't want to see that. I'm, I'm not against antiheroes. I like antiheroes, but Supergirl's not an antihero. You start crossing that line with her, you're losing me. Uh, in this case, though, particularly in this situation where this is somebody she's been fighting who's been throwing everything but the kitchen sink at her, I could see her thinking that way. Whereas I would not be comfortable with Superman doing that. And there's really, it's funny how um, there's a distinction between the two. I'm okay with one I'm okay, and not okay with it with the other. And I grew up with the original Supergirl who would not even in a million years fathom doing what this one does. So I don't know why with Supergirl I'm more okay with it, but I just am. Uh, because you know, I used to read the uh, the headband wearing Supergirl. Loved her to death. I mean, great character. Uh, but this and this is not her. And I'm okay with it. It's just it's it's funny how I don't I don't know why there's that distinction there. But yet Clark, I would not be remotely cool with it. Now the headband wearing one died, correct? Yes. Okay, that was the one who was in one of the crises and yeah, all that. That's exactly right. Okay. So, um, yeah, that's kind of where that's why it's funny that I'm just okay with that. And I don't know why. Maybe it is because she died in Christ. <laughs> maybe I mean maybe there's a point to that. Like I, I felt there was a closure to her story. Uh, I don't know. That that could be an interesting part of. I don't know what brings it there. You want to talk about the Green Lantern, uh, Red Lantern flip book? Oh yeah. Well, uh, first we're going to start off with uh, Green Lantern twenty eight. The uh, writer is Robert Vendetti, penciler Billy Tan, inker Rob Hunter. Colorist Alex Sinclair, letterer Dave Sharp, with a Green Lantern cover by Billy Tan and Alex Sinclair. Associate editor is Chris Conroy, and group editor is Matt Idelson. And the Red Lantern uh, flip, because it's a flip book, the Red Lantern issue is by Charles Sewell, the writer. Alessandro Vitti is the artist. Gabe L. Tab on colors, Dave Sharp letters. Red Lantern's cover by Stephen George Segovia with Hi-Fi. And you mentioned the editorial team already. I want to apologize for any name butchery uh, anywhere and any of that. Because, you know, we've talked about this before on the show. I'm just going to make a quick mention of it and we can move along. Because it's almost this point right now where it's redundant to say it. You follow the creative teams that have done the Green Lantern books, the whole family, previously. And that's a very scary thing to do. I love the work of the creative teams that are currently on these books. They've just gradually evolved these books into the same must-read material that it was before. 
while at the same time putting their own stamp on it, giving it a unique feel. So I don't feel like they're trying to be those creative teams in a light version. And there's something critical to that, and it's really important. And when you get this storyline, I love how this blends into there. While it's still, like, especially in the Green Lantern issue in particular, and well, in the Red Lantern issue too, this isn't derailing what's currently going on in these books. It folds in nicely. There's things going on in the Supergirl book that now has become a part of this event right now just because of the fact that Supergirl's there. But this is something, a major happening, that's happened within their continuity. So we know where this takes place in relation to what's going on in the Green Lantern books and the Red Lantern titles as well. And it somehow acts as a catalyst to bring characters together that we haven't seen together in a little bit, having deep, meaningful discussions about, hey, Supergirl's attacking us. Well, you know, uh, at least... A red unknown Red Lantern is attacking us. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and realizing that it's a Kryptonian, but not being able to know quite how to handle who she is. Because I didn't realize that. They haven't had the interaction with her, and she doesn't have the name branding like that she would have had previously in prior to the New 52. So that's the funny part. She's not... Uh, the symbol that she was previously. We need to see that happen with her. I liked that attention to detail. Oh, God, yeah. This was kind of a neat thing, especially when it first hits and you first see this because, and you know, t- you know in reality, this book came out before um, Supergirl came out. Mm-hmm. So, I, you know, when I first read this, I read, you know, because I was, we were doing all the green stuff and grab, they read it and going through before, you know, Supergirl came out. So you see this going, wait, that's Supergirl. How did this happen? You see the little note. How did this happen? Pick up Supergirl 28. Okay, in two weeks. I'll read that. But I like the fact that they did this, where they threw us right into the story, and then later they gave us the whole wrap-up and how she got the ring and everything that happened. And I thought that was a neat way of handling it, especially you know because that was a cool you know capstone on her story. That was a great way to end how she was going and where she was going on her path. And this just throws us right in the middle, just like these two unknown lanterns you know are trying to stop her you know they get this in- entity coming at them like stop bam and she's just barreling through them i absolutely love this i thought this was a really cool usage of the red lantern but also a cool usage of a kryptonian gone angry i like that she spent herself with her heat vision you know it's um you know they don't have unlimited powers just like the green lantern stone you use up all your energy you're tapped out and the way it manifested itself for Supergirl was really interesting. It, because of the fact that she's a being of rage and she hasn't been put in the pool, we don't have the coherence there that, we're, that we've seen with some of the other Rand Lanterns recently. She's just letting it all out and releasing the rage. And there's something to that. I really like seeing what this is like. It reminds me a lot of uh, the Lazarus Pits. You know, when Ra's al Ghul dumps somebody in there, they come out all crazy nuts. Um, in this case, it's we need to, let's get her in that pit pretty fast so we can actually have a convo with her. Yes. <laughs> but how dangerous would a Kryptonian be in that role? We saw this actually in the previous continuity with uh, Monel, yeah. when Monel took on the ring, and we got to see him, you know, kind of have uh, that his both sets of powers. And I liked that. I always liked that exploration with it. And it plays out really nicely here, seeing Supergirl as a Red Lantern, which we haven't seen, to my knowledge, a Red Lantern Kryptonian before now, right? No, this is, I, this is the first of this. And I like it. You know, I, I want to see her lose the ring so we can get some more cool Supergirl stuff, but I don't want to see her lose it too quickly because there is some neat stuff that happens in these two issues, especially laying some groundwork for some future stuff. Now, something I was wondering with her kind of losing her energy, could that be the fact that she's away from a yellow sun? Because she's in a whole nother sector and she's flying away from Earth. You know, and it's these guys who pull her back to uh, Mogo, who then eventually will pull her back to um, you know Earth and just pull her back into that solar. Could she have been running from you know the yellow light to weaken herself? I don't know. I don't no, because she wouldn't have the coherence. Because you're, talk, you're yeah. talking about a, a thought process that would have to be in place there. I could see that if she had the coherence, she doesn't have it yet. Right. That was just pure blind. Yeah, that was blind probably rage. Just pure blind rage, just running. On Mogo, <laughs> I love what Al was doing there. <laughs> the enlistment oath of the U.S. Armed Services. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Using that for the criminals. And they're like sitting here, 
there's a universal criminal code. But the thing I love is I like when a comic's not afraid to have a little fun, like especially when they're describing who each of these characters are. Evil Star, God Complex, power to back it up. You know, just little things like that. You know, where he's uh, there, you know, if I have to, yes, I am God. <laughs> <laughs> just stuff like that. It's not slapstick, it's fun. It made me smile. You know, sometimes uh, we you know, comics take themselves a little too seriously. It can get a little daunting if you don't every so often have an appropriate humor moment. You know, I'm not saying every book should do that. This makes sense with the amount of characters you're dealing with that you would have opportunities to do stuff like this. While at the same time, we got Kanjur Row there, who's a dictator, who, rich history in the DC universe. I was glad to see him as a part of this. And I don't know, I just, uh, <laughs> Bolt Funga, the unrelenting. <laughs> what does he do? Doesn't relent. <laughs> <laughs> just, just fun stuff. So I, I don't know, I really am enjoying that the new creative teams, Robert Venditti and, and crew, when they're using this book, aren't forgetting that there's a lot of lanterns. And there's a lot of characters sprinkled throughout the universe. Give us a sense of scope and vastness and scale within these issues. And there's something in there that's just, I love looking over and trying to see who I recognize and more importantly, who I don't. Because that's fun, too, to try and figure out, okay, who they are. Like the Fishy Lantern, because the Fishy Lantern plays a major role in the next issue, issue number 29, which we're going to talk about casually as a part of this as well, so I should add that to our discussion. But as we're looking at the Fishy Lantern, I, I don't know who, I didn't know who that was. I started going, you know, through and trying to figure out who each Lantern was from what I remember from Green Lantern Corps. And even though these are characters that we've seen previously, it's sometimes hard, I don't know if you find this, it's hard to keep the names of each lantern straight for me, which I think somebody listening to this is like, no, dude, I'm a lantern junkie and aficionado. They know everybody, and I'm in awe of that. I think that's really cool. Uh, but I think it just says something for the scale and the changing of the guard that the lanterns go through from time to time. Yeah, I'm, I need a playbook. I need to, you know, some, there have been times when I've gone back to past issues. I've jumped on Wiki and tried to figure out who the, who the different uh, lanterns are. If anybody knows of a really good Green Lantern resource material that I could jump on, I would appreciate it because I, I do sometimes forget. Like there's certain people, like I know Badge now. He's no longer the little squirrel dude for me. I know Badge. I know, um, well, Vath, I yeah. always kept calling him Van. And then it took me to realize, wait, that's not his name. He's Vath. Like, oh, I knew it began with a V. But now I've got that in my head. And there's, you know, obviously Kilowog and the various other Main Street, you know, people that I'll know. But as time goes on, I'm trying to learn the different guys. Like the fish dude, I've seen him a couple times and he's been some really neat stuff. I keep always having to look up his name. You know, and eventually that's going to lock in my head. And eventually I'll have fish dude, you know, down. <laughs> like fish, you know what? I, I think I, I think I call him Fish Dude too. As I was thinking about it, I like though that they have all these characters from um, different worlds. There's something to that. Uh, I like that there's ones that I clearly recognize because I've got a rich history with them. I like that there's ones that I don't. Uh, I think that's going to be the case when you're dealing with a military group, which is really what the land, you know, a police group. Uh, which is really what the lanterns are. If you don't take advantage of that and we don't get a chance to kind of see that they're bigger than we realize or that new faces are going to come in as rings drop off and that those new faces start to have a prominent role. That mixture, I think, is an interesting balance. I wonder how as a writer or even as a creative team or editorial or however that comes about, you make decisions about which characters come to the forefront. Obviously, it's easy when it's the ones that are fan favorites. You say, well, we've got to have Kilowog moments, right? But, yeah. uh, you know, when you start having Fishy Dude have a little bit more of a role, like we're seeing, uh, how, how does that come about? And how do you make those decisions as far as which ones to play around with? That's, it's fun to see how uh, this story unfolds. And it's the nice part about having multiple books. If they're not being spotlighted here, they can be spotlighted in the core book. And uh, that's, it makes it fun to pick these up and kind of read through them to kind of figure out who's going to be you know, some of our main players. I still like the whole philosophical discussion about using the ring, not using the ring. And how, you know, it's even the ones that aren't using the rings, we, we got to remember they have rings. And some of them are veteran ring slingers and can put it up at times when they need to. 
uh, I the resolution of this whole storyline that has kicked in from Relic is because do, do you feel that there's going to be at some point in time a resolution to whether or not Relic was right? Oh, definitely. But I think we're a while away from that. I think this is gonna, this is the long story that's going to be multiple years before we get the final, you know, the final resolution of Relic and what is the, you know, what is the state of the universe? I think, and I think it's going to come through New Guardians and the uh-huh. stuff that Kyle's doing and you know the stuff he's preparing. So the next big event—I I don't want to even say the next big event. For me, it may be next. The second next big, you know, we'll have a big event, then we'll have another big event within the green books. I think after that second big event is when we're going to get our kind of resolution, maybe to this uh, universe, to this fact. There are they tapping in the power, and because I like how they're using this as a story, as the universe now knows about this, and people are holding this against the lantern, saying, "Hey, you guys are killing the universe every time you wield your power." No, I'm not going to trust you. No, I'm not going to like you. And it's a huge part of what the the, the Green Lanterns are dealing with now. And I, I kind of enjoy that. You know, when I saw Flying Lanterns, I was really thinking it's the a Durlin. I didn't realize that it was going to be Kara, which is stupid because she was there earlier. But I didn't see this coming. I really loved how they showcased throughout this issue and the Red Lanterns issue what she brings to the table having this power you know, just the realization of the investigation was something that i really enjoyed about this part hal's realization of what's going on and realizing we got to be careful how we deal with her because of superman because we don't want this guy angry and there's a reality to that you know because who is she to superman and they don't know that backstory there is that sense of yes, this is my comrade at arms. We play, you know, we play nice together in the Justice League. But is this family for him? Uh, what is the relationship? Is he aware of her? Is he not? What does it mean if he is and he's been keeping it secret, which he hasn't been? But it, you don't have, have to necessarily have public disclosure either. Uh, it's it's an interesting story. I liked the way that there was undertones through that whole sequence. Yeah. That were there that I really liked how that was written because there was a reality to that being that this is the new 52 and what their relationship actually is. And that was something that I liked that every friendship, every relationship is complicated. And this didn't hesitate to embrace that. It was cool. Yeah. And the thing I digged about this was one, how many lanterns it takes to take her down. Mm -hmm. You look at the constructs and just the number of lanterns that are shooting beams to support that construct, the big chain and, you know, containment unit that they're using and just how much power and energy they got to excel, expend just to keep her down. But then also the discussion of, do we just take off the ring? Well, you can't. With Red Lanterns, that would be a death sentence. And is that the right thing to do? And that's another interesting concept with this whole policing up the you know the the emotional spectrum and you know dealing with all the other ring slingers. Well, if you rip it off a Red Lantern, you've just killed them. You know, is that appropriate? Is that a you know should you do that? And is the fact that she's Kryptonian the only reason they're not doing it? No, it's Part of a moral clause, you know, Mm -hmm. what is right, what is wrong. Again, these cool explorations that we're getting in the Green Lantern title. And I really, really enjoy the fact that the Green Lantern title isn't just about Hal Jordan anymore. Yes, he's the main player. Yes, we're seeing him interact and how he's dealing with it. But he's not the main player. And I always, to me, I always said I love, you know, I always enjoyed Green Lantern core a little bit more than Green Lantern a lot of times because of the multitude of the core. Well, now in the Green Lantern title, I'm getting that core. I'm getting that feeling. So it's gonna, it's adding to the, uh, I don't know, enjoyment for the whole Green Universe that when we go into each of these books, we're getting the true strength that is the Green Lantern titles, and it's the core. You know, and here's the funny part. You could take any one of those books and make them a... Because I think Kyle's book right now clearly is a spotlight title on Kyle Rayner. That can shift over time, because that book used to be a spotlight title on his team. And I think one of the nice things you can do with these books are 
depending on what's going on in your larger arcs, that, like you're alluding to, you can have spotlights of different characters. Like there was a time when this book was very much a Sinestro book. <laughs> you know, then, then it became a Sinestro and Hal book. And that was fantastic. I loved every minute of that because it fit a larger storyline. There was a direction. There was a reason to spotlight those two characters. And I think these books should always take the opportunity to explore the group, like you're mentioning, when it makes sense, to explore a focal point character in relation to the group, or to really get down deep and just explore a character. Simon Baz is a great example of a character when he was spotlighted as well. Really quite enjoyed that. So it's going to be interesting to see as we move forward which characters are going to wind up where. Here's the funny part. With the status quo change for the Earth Lanterns that comes through part of this. And I know I'm jumping ahead of that, but as we'll talk about it. Part of the resolution in this is that there's only one Earth Lantern right now, and it's Simon Baz. Otherwise, the sector is controlled by the Red Lanterns. So if that's the case, what does that mean for the Justice League? Well, very simple. Simon Baz is the only Lantern for the Justice League. Or we're going to get a Red Lantern on the League, which I don't think we will, because the Lanterns aren't Earth defense. They're not Earth law. They are, you know, Guy is looking at this as Sector 2814. This is the whole, this is his whole sector. Earth is just a single planet in his sector. So I think the only, you know, Justice League we're going to get is Simon. And I think that's kind of neat that he is the Earth Lantern. He does not leave Earth because if he leaves Earth, that starts up a problem with the Lanterns. He, they've given him dispensation to be on Earth and only Earth. He can't leave, which he's cool with because he doesn't want to leave. And Hal wants somebody on the planet just to keep an eye on things. And I think he's the right guy. And I like how they're using it and how they're explaining why he's still going to be around. This was a really cool usage of the character that the fact that he's not quote unquote with the core, but he is with the core. He didn't go through all the traditional stuff. He doesn't know all the... The only alien he knows is Badge. And that's, you know, it was an uneasy friendship that he learned, okay, this guy's cool. So eventually he would learn the other aliens. Eventually he would learn the other people. And I think he would be very accepting of them because he's been, you know, mistreated and just misjudged throughout his entire life. So he could recognize, okay, there's more to a person than their physical exterior. Let's see what they're about. So I think he eventually will be a really cool addition to the whole Green Lantern Corps, but but for right now, he's right where he needs to be, and I like it. Yeah, I was looking over the, the cover for that Justice League United title that's upcoming, just to see if there's a Green Lantern on there, and I'm not seeing that. We've got Animal Man, uh, Green Arrow, Supergirl, Stargirl, Adam Strange, and uh, Martian Manhunter on the cover. So... And I know that that's for the first five-issue arc, which takes place in Canada. And I know they're going to be trading off arcs between certain locations. So I don't know if that means different teams or what. I don't, I'm, I'm intrigued by the whole thing, just to see. Hmm. That's kind of cool. Yeah, yeah. And, and what does that mean for Dark? Is Justice League Dark being canceled? I didn't think so. I hadn't heard anything, but yeah. you usually have better news than I do. I, I don't, you know what, I, I haven't, I know that Animal Man is, and I don't, I haven't heard anything about Justice League Dark, although I might be, uh, that would be a shame. Yeah, because I really like, um, again, I like the vibe of it, and I like the difference, it's a great magic book, and it's a great usage of the magic universe, you know, Constantine's awesome, so I get plenty, you'll, you'll get the vibe from there, but, you know, it's the two titles, you know, kind of work well with each other and you know with you know pandora and phantom stranger and you have all this this magic you know creepy you know ness in the the whatnot that is the dc magic universe i I like all the different titles each give you a little bit of vibe and justice league dark let's be honest has some characters in there that they put in other books that didn't you know go on their own and it keeps these characters together and it gives us our taste of frankenstein which we're not getting anywhere else and you know i even like i really like swamp thing on it because again it's seeing him interact with different characters than he would in his book yeah and it doesn't look like they're uh 
being canceled. I don't see anything alluding to that, which is great because I love that book. I would be really sad if that was the case. I just wanted to take a look and double check and see. Uh, obviously, we have no idea what the team membership is going to look like after this. Um, there's an interesting little blurb. I was looking on uh, Wikipedia and then searching other places on the net. Because uh, the Constantine that we've been seeing images from is from the Constantine television series. Right. There's going to be a Constantine TV series, which I'm really excited about. But the Del Toro film is still in the works for Justice League Dark. And there would be a Constantine on that as well. Oh, nice. So I hope I hope both projects come to fruition. I would love to see that. Oh, God, yeah. That, you know, well, I'm pretty sure the Constantine pilot is ready to rock and roll. It's either filmed or it's currently filming or it's everything. Well, did you see Matt Ryan, the actor, yeah. as Constantine? I mean, it looks, I mean, dead ringer. Yeah, that's a that's a spot on. I, I want to see how gritty they get and how, you know, how how dark they're going to take them. Because, as, we, as you know, it's one of the things that I love about Constantine is that you know what <laughs> he he's not the the he's not the boy scout he's willing to you know do what needs to be done and I want to see if they're going to give that to their main character did you see the flash costume yeah yeah the new one yeah the I liked it yeah. you know it's got um did we talk again, about did we talk about this I don't remember if we did or not we talked about it, but I don't know if we talked about it or if we talked about it on the show. Yeah, I can't remember when we did it. I know we had a conversation on it. I don't remember if it was in the mics or just us chatting. So. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I think it's cool, though. I'm, I'm into it. Yeah, I'm definitely excited for all this stuff coming down the line. You know, it, again, it's it's curious to see where they go with the characters and you know what they're going to do with it because you know it's. You know, Constantine isn't your your typical hero, and I'm wondering where they're going to go with it. But with Arrow, they made him a killer. That opening season, he was he was an assassin, man, and he was he had a really good body count, and he had no problem taking out people. So, if they're willing to go that dark on Arrow, you know, we got the uh, you know possible dark on Constantine. And you know, you look at the creative team behind the, the TV show. They're willing to take things darker, and they're willing to take things, you know, a little bit. You know, they're true to the, um, you know, true, you know, be true to the main character. I read uh, one interview, and I be honest, I don't remember who was saying it, but they said they've been a fan of Constantine since the '80s. And they're talking about since he first came out, and when he was first as a recurring character on Swamp Thing, and then got his own book through Hellblazer, and just so. You know, whichever person that was, they've got a long time history with Constantine, and I read that. I'm like, okay, they know the character, they know the the jerk that he, the the wonderful jerk that he can be. So I'm confident they're gonna you know give us something, and I'm gonna wait and see until my you know, hold all judgment until then. But in the end, until then, I'm looking forward to it. I got a new statue. Forgot to tell you, um, I got a Superman statue. Oh, cool! I got the uh, Kenneth Roquefort one. Oh, nice! You know the one based on his artwork, where he, it's it's like Superman, like in a landing pose, and it's real majestic looking. I really, really like it. And then um, I got you. I I gave you your uh, Christmas present. We haven't seen yeah. it. It's funny we don't record live anymore, so I haven't seen you since then. But um, I got a chance to, and I'm I'm gonna have to grab this one, the Rags Morales one uh, from the the reboot. Where, yeah. he's in, where he's in the t-shirt and that, and I'm very jealous of it. I, I should have grabbed one for myself when I grabbed yeah. one for you. <laughs> it's an absolutely wonderful present. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, because that was one where uh, I, it's tough for us. as we, we talk about it all the time as comic fans to try and grab something for each other because we end up grabbing things that we want. But I was pretty sure that was a safe one. Uh, but I was instantly jealous of it when it arrived because uh, I'm, I'm probably not going to get all of the Superman or the Batman statues um, from the series because it's just financially to be able to afford that. But I realized I didn't have a Superman statue. You know, and he's such an a important character to me. So I was trying to find out which one. And I really, one of the things I liked when Scott Lobdell took over as, as a writer on Superman during that run was Kenneth Roquefort's arc and his take on Superman really just stuck with me. I really liked what he was doing with the character. So when they sh announced the statue and you saw, I saw the first image of it, I'm like, oh, I really, really want this. And I love, I love the view visual look of the new suit. And uh, cause it's, it's the armored suit, but it's not overdone, which 
I don't want a, I like the Kryptonian heritage to the suit. That part's really cool with me. But let's not go crazy with the whole armor look to it because he's Superman. <laughs> you know? And I like the subtlety of the armor look on this. Uh, where it it looks more like, you know, you can see like these Superman abs and, you know, the muscle and that's it's Superman. That's what you should see. You know, you should look like, you know, wow, I could never be that, but wouldn't it be cool? Because <laughs> Superman's one of those characters you got to look up to, and it's just a beautiful, beautiful statue. I don't know if people collect those or the action figures or, you know, what people are getting. I'm sure people get a variety of different things, but uh, I got it because my little office here, I'm kind of gradually trying to turn into um, things before that I kind of kept hidden away. I'm trying to put them out more on display. I'm even going back to things like I've got a Batman and Robin alarm clock from when I was a kid, you know, a talking one. Oh, cool. Yeah, that I put up on, on my shelf. Just things that, like, before I kind of, like, kept tucked away. I'm like, no, I want these things out. You know, I want to be able to see them and just kind of get that kind of cool, you know, vibe when I'm in here. You know, kind of you know, letting out my inner geek. And, uh, you know, it's, it's turned into my little man cave, so to speak. You know, this one, because I'm in here a lot for work. And it's it's strangely uplifting when you look around and you see Batman statue or Superman statue or something like that. It gets me, it strangely gets me motivated to do, you know, things for my job, and uh, it's something cool about that. You know, when you you feel comfortable in an area for it, so it's not just for podcasting. It's cool for that. Yeah, that is strange. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I said it was stranger. I said it was strange. I'm. I'm a, <laughs> you know what's stranger? Uh-huh. We went from a. Supergirl, Green Lantern, Red Lantern conversation into this. Oh, we're going back to St. Walker in a second, How so don't do worry. That? Don't worry, we're going because it's. I mean, we're geeking out about DC related <laughs> stuff anyway. We started talking about the Justice League. That's yes, what got yes, us to this, but... and which Green Lantern would be on the Justice League. Yeah, I, yeah. and that's so. Uh, there was a path, and there's a path back too, because, because the path now that I talked seen... about hope and the yes. hope that the stuff in my room leads to, let's talk about a guy who's without hope or hopeless at the moment in St. Walker. Loving his story. Oh, my God, yeah. I've always adored the character. I've had a fondness for him since he was first introduced. I loved what James Robinson did when he put him on the Justice League. That character, I I thought he was one of the... Because he was there for the whole run. The spotlight character, who I liked in that room, I've always liked him in the Green Lantern books. He's somebody I would love to read a St. Walker series. You know, and the Blue Lanterns, I always thought they'd be an interesting group of characters. Not isolated to their planet but seeing them interact with the world because we don't get to see it enough and here's a great example of what you were talking about earlier nice strength of the green lantern book right now is we've now you know taken a side story where we're seeing saint walker interacting with mogo saint walker interacting with hal them trying to have a private conversation but like mogo's everywhere (laughs) But, but you can't walk away from the planet (laughs) right but also mogo real you know explaining to them hey you got to understand, you know, I can shift my focus elsewhere. I'm still going to be here, but I can't possibly pay attention to everything. Explaining why there's a, and that explains why there's a Durlin running around his planet. He's not quite sure where the Durlin is. Yeah. <laughs> or she. Actually, Mogo's a she, right? Yes, Mogo uh, is yeah, a she. Yeah, I keep, I keep thinking of it's years of assuming Mogo, Mogo is a he. I like that, actually. Because uh, we tend to talk about Mother Earth now. It's Mother Mogo. Uh, I love the St. Walker storyline. I like the journey. I like that he's not instantly back with hope. This is something we're going to have to see him go walk about. And, you know, because he even addresses in issue number 29 that, like, I am not a saint anymore. I'm just a walker. And I want to follow that journey. I'm captivated by it. What is going to, what's it going to take to make St. Walker have hope again, you know, for him to connect with that side of himself. Because he's a character I don't see becoming another kind of lantern. It just doesn't fit. I would be really disappointed if that wow happened with him. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I don't, I don't want to see him a red. I don't want to see him instantly a green. Even though he clearly understands Will, that's not who he is. He's just disconnected with the part that made him, in our eyes, clearly the leader of... The Blue Lanterns, I want to see him reconnect with that side of himself. And I'm going to be patient for it. I think the story that's being delivered here is top-notch. I really care about it. Yes. And he's going to come back. Mm -hmm. And I am just anticipating that moment where I'm I'm 
here's my assumption what's going to happen is there's going to be some big massive event going on and people are getting dropped and the the, the greens are going to need that recharge they're going to need that moment and off screen you'll just see the words do not worry all will be yeah, well yeah, you'll yeah. flip the page and there he is putting the ring back on and it's just going to be that bam moment you know just you know inspiring hope and just being saint walker now the other side of this he could still inspire hope without engaging the ring and that's something i'd like to see his journey go down mm-hmm. because he is, there is still hope in him because yeah. the ring didn't disappear. The ring didn't fade away. It's just hovering right there waiting because he, they, as you said, we're not on speaking terms right now. He's not you know, willing to connect to that, not willing to open up and go with that. There's, there is something else that is on his mind and there's a journey he's got to go down. So I think we're going to get some cool St. Walker moments where he's not using his ring, just like we get some cool lantern moments, some green lantern moments where they don't use their rings. And I think that's going to be the process and the path that St. Walker is going to go down. But eventually I see him putting the ring back on. I see it coming back. Yeah. And I'm willing to wait for it because to me, when you have these character pieces like that, there's something about the character. Like what I like about St. Walker is I feel like he's a character that's just genuinely good, you know, which we don't, you don't always get that in comics and that's okay. Cause there's a reality to that, but it's nice every so often to have that character. You say, what do you like about St. Walker? He's just good. I mean, he's nice and pleasant and good and caring on an intense level. Cause that's just how he's wired. He's not somebody that I would find interesting to see go down an evil path. Like I don't want that. To me, that's a miss. If somebody did that, it's a gross misunderstanding of who Saint Walker is as a character. Like he lost his entire core, and instead of going, you know, and becoming a rage-filled lantern, he disconnects with hope. But he's still like there's a Zen to him. He's a good guy who's try who realizes the inherent horrible thing that happened, including finding out what he did about the light. Like it was like everything that he believed in was spat at. And instead of going bad, he's trying to find what is my place now? What does this mean for me? How do I find hope in all of this? And there's something to that. I just, I find the character fascinating. Oh, God, yeah. And it, you think about it. We all in our lives know that just that really nice person, yeah, that, yeah, you yeah. know, person that can go through it. And, you know, I always associate St. Walker with those people, you know, and like I'll look at different people in my lives and say they'd be a red, they'd be a yellow, they'd be green, you know. And there's a, there are very few people that I would say, OK, they are blue. You know, and it's just that. You know, just it's you you say nice, but it's not even nice. It goes beyond that because I can be nice at times. I can be rage filled at times. I can be, you know, envious. I can go through the full color spectrum. Sure, sure. You know, but Sane Walker is just that at all times. He has that peace. He has that nice. He's got that that Zen you you mentioned. I was like, yeah, that's another cool. Just you, you. I hear his voice when I read it, and it's just that very soft and soothing voice. And it's just that, you know, there is, it's not emotionless, but it's not, you know, there, there is no negativity to it. It is just that calming. It is just that, just that peacefulness. And you're just like, wow. You know who he reminds yeah. me of that we know? Sally. Exactly. I, I, I was thinking the exact same thing. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's like, I mean, she's totally that. Per- and I mean, that t- in every way you could ever say that to be complimentary. That's exactly yeah. the way that I mean it. I've always considered her this genuine. We've got a, we've got a mutual friend, and I think anybody who knows her would totally agree that this is the kind of person that she is. She's just one thing that you would universally say, like how, describe her. She's nice. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And I mean, that's at the core who she is. Uh, and it's rare that you encounter people that are like that. But his journey reminds me, and just in many ways, of her. The character's always reminded me of just her because it's unique. You don't find people that are wired so totally that way very often. But she is. <laughs> I think we all know, I hope, oh, yeah. you know, hopefully you're lucky enough to know somebody who in your life who was like that. But uh, she's she's that kind of person. The conversations that seeing them on this mogo, you know, with like this, there's animals around and it's peaceful and it's something out of a, you know, 
film. It's kind of magical and just z- peaceful. Peaceful. Yeah. That's exactly what this it's guy a paradise. is. Yeah. It's paradise. Yeah. And you're just like, it, and there's little comedic moments as well. And it's not overdone, but it's just that perfect blend. Like, his Bogo's ring is sitting on a branch. And Hal even comments, oh, that's where you keep your ring. I always assumed it'd be down in the core. Then how would the tree monks play with it, core leader Jordan? And then the next panel, you see the little tree monk running with the ring in his hand. He's like, okay, yeah, good point. Um, And it's little funny bits like that throughout every time they do with Mogo, you get those little moments, especially with Mogo St. Walker discussions. It's some really cool, just personal time between these two characters. Guy is a red lantern. Uh, the whole shadow thief thing that was going on. Uh, the fact that the lanterns first show up on his world, you know, that's kind of our cliffhanger. The proximity alarm goes off, you know, and the ship notifies that they're there. But then we flish, flip into the Red Lantern book and see Guy in the middle of, he's trying to win back ice. It's funny how, and I think this is a Guy thing. We do this. You think you change to a certain point, which he has. I mean, we've seen it as readers. And all of a sudden, that means that that person's going to drop everything in their life and come back to you, and <laughs> everything's going to be the way you assume it's going to be. We as guys, I think we inherently do this. I think there's a reality to this, and it's well written so well because I love her reaction to that, well, I understand you've changed. And uh, she said, I, I can even acknowledge that that's the case, but that doesn't mean that I'm in that pl- You know, like I have gotten to the point where I'm in that place that I want this back. That's not to say that it never will be, but I'm just not there right now. And you also can't put the weight of your motivation to be this person on me, you know, because that's an, it, it's not a healthy way for a relationship to be. Her point's valid, you know, to sit there and say, well, I'm this way because I wanted to do it for you instead of I'm this way because this is who I am. That puts an inordinate amount of pressure on her as a person to say, well, what happens if I leave him? You know, and if he goes down a dark path, then is that due to me? You can't put that on somebody. If there's a truth to that whole sequence, it felt very human. And we're talking about human on this episode. Very human, very real. Great writing. Because I was okay. sitting there like, oh, yeah, I get it. And what a great relationship moment. Um, it's clear this writer's been through stuff like this. <laughs> and another thing I always equated that with is you think about people who they're going to stop drinking because of somebody or they're sure. going to stop smoking because of somebody and they're like you know, and that's not the the way you'd go about that you know and addicts will tell you you can't do this for somebody else you have to do this because you want to change you want to make you know this is no longer who you want to be you want to be somebody else and the same thing goes with the romance it's you can't you know start dating someone you know say see i changed now take me back it's not the two aren't the, you know, it's not a, a give and take. It's, this is who I am, you know, do you want to be with me? You know, and if they don't want to be with you, that's still who you have to be. And I love the fact that Ice, you know, said, told them flat out, said, hey, guy, you're, you're, you're changing, but are you changing for the right reasons? Is this who you are? Or are you changing to get me back? It's, you can't do that. And I like the fact that she would recognize that and she would step up and she would say that to him. And eventually guy would kind of get it. You know, you know, guy is learning and it's nice to see, you know, that the rate, the rage isn't just about pure rage and hatred. There is still the thought process. There is still the thinking, there is still the rage and the fire and the passion. So it's, it's kind of neat to see where the red lanterns go through, especially now that, Adding a little bit of heartbreak into Guy's uh, arsenal. Yeah, 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 exactly. And and to me, him continuing, I think he wound up in this place, and he won't see it, not just because of her. Well, I, no, I take it back. He does see it because he's made a decision now that, like, I think if Hal offered him a cure for the whole Red Lantern thing right now, he wouldn't take it. No. This is who he is. Yeah. And he's accepted the, the rage in him. He's accepted the fire. And... You know, especially you, we saw in the past issues with Red Lanterns willing to sacrifice themselves for the Red Lanterns, for their brethren. Uh-huh. It's not just about anger. It's not just there is other types of rage and there is other ways to utilize that rage. We, you know, it's, you know, it's interesting that you can explore 
what is rage? Because will, you know, hope, fear, these are concepts that are pretty solid locked in there. But what is rage? Rage can come from love. Rage can come from hate. Rage can come from all types of different emo- emotional spectrums. And it's when you pull from that, that's where you get this different power levels. That's where you get these stronger lanterns. Rage from hatred is very powerful. But if you've got a rage protecting someone you love, that's going to beat rage for hate. You know, you put any you know, mother and or father where you know, they've got a rage to protect their child, guess what? You know, step back, you're going to see some fireworks. If you're just taking but somebody... That's also, that's also a rage from hate. Because it, your rage is directed at the person that you. No, no, I'm, I'm, yeah. agreeing, I'm agreeing with what you're saying, so I'm not discounting that. But it's more comp- Rage is a very complicated emotion, yes. in the sense that it's not a one-trick thing. You can't just say it's a rage from this, rage from that. Uh, the the ones that get the lanterns are usually people that have rage from a variety of different sources. So there's a validity to what you're saying, but it's not as simple as like I'm a lantern because I'm a rage for love. No, you're not. You would be then if if your love is that strong, you would be a star sapphire. It's your rage is all encompassing, and it it is what you're saying, but it's also that your rage is due to love, your rage is due to hate, your rage is due to this, your <laughs> your rage is due to a television show being cancelled, your yes. rage is due to rage on, on so many different levels because it's so consumed you that it lashes out in so many different ways. Uh, so, you're right that the more of it you have and the more directions that come from it, you're, the rage from love that you're mentioning, the loss of a loved one that we see so often that is a catalyst of change for these lanterns uh, is, is something that I think is very powerful. It's, it's an interesting, tricky emotion. This series has evolved over time and become... I did, it's funny how I always liked the Red Lantern book. I thought it was interesting to explore the concept. Now I love it. And I have for, we had Myron on a while ago and talked about how this series has changed and evolved. And I meant what I said then about how I was getting really just greatly attached to this series. Now I'm even more so. I, I just feel like adding Guy to the book, adding the human Red Lantern to the book, Raz, uh, you know, it's um, I, I, there's something about... You know these uh, these characters that have just made this book interesting. Yeah, and of course the one of the best Red Lanterns is my man Dexter. Absolutely oh, yeah. love the little cat and just his character growth that we've seen. You know because you think about just the loyalty he showed. You know to um, you know Atrocitus that you know, has been a really cool point where he kept raging on and he kept the Trocidus alive. And now we've got this cool fight sequence where he's doing, you know, he's creating, um, you know, constructs. And granted, it's a giant uh, tiger, but you know what? For a cat, that works. I can see him doing that. I can see him going with this. It's not just, you know, there is that more to him. And I'm loving seeing this character go. And just, it's, he he went from being a funny character, ah, yeah, funny, the cat's full of rage, to, dang, this is a cool character. Bleez uh, is another one who I'm really loving. Just the whole relationship there. He can't be dead, right? I mean, Atrocitus is going to clearly looks like he's going to win this fight, but he's got to survive, right? The human lantern. Oh yeah. He, well, <laughs> I hope he does <laughs> because again, he, him and his and Belize's relationship is been an interesting growth. And yeah. you're assuming it, they're laying out the groundwork. looks like he's dead. So I'm assuming we're going to get that moment where we realize he's not dead and we'll maybe get some type of emotional re- response from Blee's and there could, there's a lot of potential storylines that it's going to play out. But again, another red lantern sacrificing himself for the core. Cause he's not just sacrificing himself so she can leave. He's sacrificing himself so that she can go and warn the others that he's out there, yeah. that he's come back. And it's he even says that this isn't just about you. You have to warn the core. You have to, and it's a concept of the Red Lantern core. It's a sacrifice for the greater good, something we never saw in the other lanterns. And it wasn't, it's not like he was the first one to do this. It was another Red Lantern sacrifice that motivated him to do this, that made him step up. Same thing with Gardner. There's this 
the development of this concept of who the Red Lanterns are. And I'm looking forward to seeing where this goes because we right now have two separate cores. Are we going to get a united core? Are we going to get something different? Yeah, Rancor uh, and uh, John Moore. It's funny. I don't ever call him by his human name. Um, yeah, yeah. It was. I, I looked it up just because I know I never call him by that. So I'm like, what? What is? What is Rancor's human name? And Rancor, I don't. Just to me, has just been a great addition to the book. And I don't think, and I don't want us to lose him just because we've got another Human Lantern and Guy Gardner on the team. I think there's a validity to Rancor that uh, is worth keeping him around. Oh, definite, and I think he's going to be around. I As too. I said, I, I, you know, it it wouldn't it wouldn't surprise me if they do kill him off because Atrocitus is a nasty, you know, sob, and I could see him just tossing his head to them to try to get, you know, an emotional response. But again, when you're dealing with rage, do you want to enrage the people, mm-hmm. you know, that you're fighting? So having him being tortured and suffering, that could actually work better for Atrocis than actually killing him and displaying his dead, you know, body, you know, parts around his uh, castle. That could, you know, in a way work against him. I can't now, wait. Oh, good. I was going to ask about the beach ball. Mm-hmm. Because he's not really a beach ball anymore. His body has changed a little bit. Which do you like better, look-wise? Do you think that this is permanent? Oh, God, no. He's just healing right now, and eventually he'll be back to being a full beach ball again. Because yeah. like, this yeah, is what Shadow, he, Shadow Thief did to him. Yeah, yeah. Because even comment on wait till I'm back to normal. He, I think I think his his species will be able to you know bounce back, and he he will be a ball again. But it's weird because looking at him like you know the beach ball way. I again, he was another character. I kind of chuckled at. And I always said, "Oh, okay, that's kind of funny." And you know, it, he always seemed like he had to work harder to be intimidating to me. This look, I got to say, I think it's a little bit more intimidating. Oh yeah, just, I agree. Cuz there's definitely I think this has a little bit more creepy and freaky factor to it, and I kind of like it. Now, again, I don't I wouldn't mind if they went back to the original cuz that's who he is, but if they kept him looking like this, I wouldn't complain because it, it does have a really like dang, that's uh, pretty nasty there. <laughs> I like the visual too. I agree with you. If that's what you're going for there, you know, that with the question. Um I would yeah, agree with yeah. you. I really enjoy the visual. I think he's an interesting character and I think this just added to an intrigue for him that uh, I I didn't I've always liked the character, but he was more of a comic relief than um, an intimidating character. I think that has changed in the writing of him since Guy has come on the team. I've seen the validity of him as a character yeah. beyond what he was before. But you're right, This visual, it's funny how that visual look has taken it to a different place as well. So I, it's funny, if he goes back to his original shape, I think of him differently now because of this. And if he stays this shape, I'm cool with it because I think of him differently now because of this. So I don't care. Uh, really what ends up happening with him. I, just, I, I loved the wordplay with it, though. And he did lose yeah. the intimidation. You can start making square jokes when you look like that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, ain't got time for squares. Come on. Yeah. I laughed. That I whole did. bit that they went through. Who's the square? Biox. <laughs> the guy's name is Box. I'm like, oh, that's awesome. And then just, you know, even, you know, ain't got time for squares. I, I get, He still is a comedic moments. But it doesn't take away from any of the energy or any of the the flow of it. It it, it has that you know, you need this type of banter. You know that these two are ready to go down. These two are ready to just to throw down and start beating on each other at a moment's notice, and they're just waiting for it. You're just waiting for that one thing that sends it over the edge. Like when he spits the the, the acid blood at the feet of Hal. If he had just been an inch over and hit Hal's foot, they would have been throwing punches. And I like just that antis- just that anger and that that uh, that energy between the uh, reds and the greens. It's it comes off really nicely with artwork, story, and those little comedic moments adds to it. You know, each one's just poking a little bit at each other, just trying to get a little bit more anger out of each other. Have we ever talked on the show about Guy's new look? I don't think we have. Because uh, what do you think of that? I I, I visually like it. I think uh, again, we've got a character who has evolved. Um, there's been a transition into becoming a Red Lantern, and due to accepting his role, in in ways it's it's matured. Guy, I've always liked seeing Guy 
It's evolution. You know, he was a character that initially you wanted to see everyone punch. <laughs> um, and I go back into the beginning of his history. That was what you wanted to see. You wanted to see Guy Gardner get punched uh, into a character now where I want to see him punching people. Uh, just because I oftentimes he'll go on rants and raves where I really agree with what he's saying. So he's an interesting character as far as your sides have changed with him. I like the visual look a great deal just because it, it to me, is representative of the fact that he's in a different place now. Where, uh, where are you at, though? I know you're a big guy fan. Yeah, I'm a huge guy fan now. And, and I go from the exact opposite of with the, you know, the guy Gardner bowl haircut, just absolutely hated him. And just anytime he was on a you know, reading, I'm like, oh, what the heck? Why, why is this guy here? You know, why is he here? Let's just get rid of him and give us a new lantern. And to now just absolutely loving this character. And when, you know, the, the hair started growing out, I'm like, okay, that makes sense. When he starts growing the big, you know, the, the biker mustache I'm like you know what it kind of fits it'll work for him he can pull it off and as they change his look as they tweak with you know who he is and you know his style i'm okay with it because again this is you know red lantern guy gardner he needs to let a little bit of the anger out he needs to let a little bit of the darkness it's not clean cut core now if he had this look and he was still wearing green i don't know I don't know if I would like it as much just because I think I like him doing this look in the red. Yeah, if he was in yeah. the green, I like him a little bit neater, a little bit cleaner uh -huh. because it's more of the uniform coat. It's more of, you know, just that, you know, it's the, the, the military mindset. It's the clean cut mindset. It's, you know, when you're serving, you know, when you're serving and protecting others, you don't want to look like one of the bad guys. You want to look like, hey, you can trust me. You know, it's that present presentation of honesty and trust. But when you're a Red Lantern, you don't really need to worry about that. You can let your hair down. You can let yourself grow the beard and the mustache. And you can, you know, get yourself a little bit dirty. And it fits and it works. And I'm kind of digging the look. And I want to see if they're going to change it some more. Or if eventually if he goes back to green, does he change it? Or if, you know, this red will change it again. Well, if this guy red gets a little bit cleaner, will he clean up his look? I don't know. I want to see where it goes. Amen to your thoughts on um, – I wasn't thinking that way about you know him versus green versus this um, as far as why the visual would be different. But I really liked your explanation because that matches my feelings on it. I really like that idea that you know this, this is a different sort of guy. and He's grown comfortable into this role, so visually we need to see him grow comfortable into this role. And that's where it really works for me. The Atrocitus thing that's going on right now, you know, Atrocitus is, has been bested by Guy. And his people didn't help him when that happened. So Guy Gardner has really taken over a leadership role there, and he's coming to reclaim everything and, and making big plans by unleashing new Red Lanterns. That's how Kara got into this place. Because he's done this, and we got a new ring that Kara's got on her, is Kara going to stay with them for now or be an ally of theirs now that she's coherent? Is she going to fight the battle against Atrocitus? Or do you think uh, or we're going to see her just in her own book deal with this and eventually... It's clear she's going to go back to just being Supergirl. But the question is, what is the journey for that? And do you have a preference on what that journey is? Like, where do you want to see this go? Well, I want to see her a little bit as a Red. Definitely want to see her go back to being Supergirl just yes. because, you know, I like... You know, I like where the character was going. I think this is a good piece of the puzzle. But I, I'm thinking the fight with Atrocitus is what's going to get rid of the red from her. Because those were Atrocitus', Atrocitus rings that he released. Sure. And I'm wondering if he can pull the ring off of her. And you, know, you think about the fight going on. You know, you've got this person who now has a clearer head. She still has the Kryptonian powers, and she's got the Red Lantern powers. That's definitely a formidable foe you're fighting. So if I'm Atrocitus and I can pull the ring off of her, I'm going to do that. Yeah, because especially with somebody with her power levels, I don't want to add to it. And maybe because of who she is and what she is, she's able to survive a ring separation. Or maybe the, the, the rules of the rings have changed. 
you know, we don't know where things are now as compared to where they were in the past. I think I, I think her. all bets are off once you go back into the blood pool and once you kind of go through that transformation. Maybe it's not so cut and dry anymore. I want to see her beat it though. On some, I don't, I don't know. Like to me, if you're doing a storyline like this, it should be part of continuing to evolve the character. So. You know, this I think is a is a perfect opportunity for her to show as a character some growth, and for this journey to show us something different about her, where she's evolved, come to terms with some things that before she didn't. You know, kind of like this is the way to let all of that finally out, then to be able to self evaluate and no longer needing this ring, and somehow that is a catalyst for her losing it on some level. And I don't know what that's going to look like, but I would like to see. And I'm fine. Everything you said, as far as Atrocis being able to take the rings off, so I'm fine with that. I don't have anything against that. But there's something lost if we don't see an evolution of her, a growth of her from this, because this is a big event. Uh, it can be a very traumatic event, and it should help you in some levels to see things a little differently. I think to me, what's so interesting about this book has been guys had an evolution and and grown as a person through this journey kara should have the same experience but it's going to look drastically different because it's her does she outgrow the need for the ring whereas guy on the other hand has settled into the need to be the leader of this group i got an idea Mm -hmm. something and it just popped in my head as you were talking okay you know you think about with you know the kryptonian alphabet and symbols and all that the the superman the 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 house of l crest is hope now we know that the hope you know the blue ring is what can separate people can cure them what if she is the cure what if she can cure herself just because of her ability to inspire hope, her ability? She has that. She doesn't have a blue ring, and she won't get a blue ring, but just because who she is, just because of who you know Superman is, just because of all of that energy, she can beat this. Out of, you know, and I don't want to say sheer willpower, but it's not. It's willpower. It's hope. It's that true hero inside. It's that gut check that we talk about. We say that Supergirl has in her. Mm-hmm. And we've seen these glimpses of really, you know, strength of character, strength of being. What if all this is what's able to push that ring off of her hand? And she chooses to reject the ring and push it out of her, and she's free and clear. I don't know. I want to see, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm anxious that's for the storyline. That's what story I want to see. <laughs> Here's the thing. I care. You know, it's and that's really the pivotal thing about this is I really care what's going to happen here. I love the bit at the end where Hal and Guy are like, huh, I think that's Superman's family member. And uh, the guy is just like rolling his eyes. Oh, right. <laughs> just It was a great Guy's ending. Guy not Superman's favorite lantern. <laughs> no, no, no. Everyone has one and it just happens to be that it's not Guy. So. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's a good storyline. I really, really enjoy that. It's a clever way of doing this. Can can we talk a little bit about Green Lantern issue number twenty nine? Just one quick one oh, quick go ahead. point, and it's something I, I'll be honest with. I just noticed it this second. Okay, when after they push Kara into the 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 the, the blood pool, and you got those cool moments between Hal and Guy, and they're talking and just they're going back and forth, etc. Up in the one panel, the upper corner, we've got the beach ball and box talking, and it looks like they're well, they aren't ta- to- they aren't talking; they're ready to throw down. Yeah, they're ready to throw down. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. But we got those two again in the again another just panel. You know, just a nod back to the previous comments, and I, you know, because you know he's got his fist up, he's ready to punch him. So you know, something happened, something was said between the two of them that it's just again that further little comedic moment inside these pages. Now, as we go back into the issue number twenty nine of Green Lantern, and we start taking a look, we see uh, the, our little fishy lantern yeah. has found the vials that the Durlin brought with him or her, or whatever the Durlin is. I'm guessing it's a him, just because of the way the, the issue ends off. And it's interesting to see that kind of weakness, uh, addiction of a sort, in the uh, the Green Lantern. Because that's not the Durlin, right? That's a Green Lantern who happens to have found that, because the Durlin is upset later that that's missing, right? Right, that's how I took it. That, okay. the, that we got our Lantern found this and said, hey, what's this? But the Durlin, I'm taking it, the Durlin needs that to trick 
Mogo to trick everybody. Those are pro- I took it that those were like DNA samplings, you know, that they need to ingest to really make it look like they are who they are pretending to be. So, but on some level, there's some kind of um, drug or medicinal a- aspect to it because Fishy Dude, you know, is looking for it as being his stash. So whatever's in there is something that Fishy Dude is like really enjoying. To the point where you know you you hide that stuff away and don't tell anybody about it because of the fact that you're getting some sort of effect from it, right? Well, I didn't take it that fishy dude was hiding and taking getting. I took it that fishy dude said, "Hey, what's this?" I wonder where I hid you. Oh, I wonder who hid you here. I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh, okay. You're right. I'm reading because his ring scanned for inconsistencies. Right. So the ring is looking for something that's out of the ordinary from Bogo. Didn't fishy? Didn't fishy? What's this? Like. Because the vials are empty. So what did Fishy do with this do with the stuff inside? That I don't know. I took it that they You're right, took I was reading samples. you're right, I was reading that wrong. Because I wonder who hid you here, you're right, it's drastically different. I was thinking I thought he hid it there, but you're right. Um, but he took the stuff inside there. How? I want I mean this is stuff we're gonna see next issue. I'm glad actually it's that we're Green we had Lantern, to, he could just create little vials. Sure, but why not take the ones that are there? I'm hoping he set up a trap. I'm hoping right uh, now if someone's watching those things that, okay, bingo, we got our Durlon. Nice. Or, who is this? <laughs> yeah, 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 you're right. Uh, I would like to see that, too. That's where I'd like to see it go. It'd be a trap. I like that idea. I like how that storyline's kind of a background story. Then we fish from that to hell. See, and this is where I know, you know, you said you like that the book doesn't always focus on hell, but... It is Hal Jordan's book. You've got to have these sequences where now we're addressing what happened in the Red Lantern's book with Hal and his family. And this was, to me, the sequence that I really loved because not only did we get to see Hal interacting with his family about the whole, there's a war coming. I've got to be a part of it, you know, and this is going to take me away for a while. And due to some deals that I've made, I cannot be Earth's Green Lantern. Earth's Green Lantern is Baz, and I've instructed Baz to look out for my family. And right down to that moment where, you know, oh, you're that guy that's, you know, running around with the squirrel, right? And, uh, yeah, my son says that he was wishing that it was his Uncle Hal. I, what a powerful moment, uh, because I would not want to be Baz in that moment, but it's also a truthful moment, right? You know, yeah. your family member, your uncle, who you don't get to see much, is one of the cooler characters in the DC Universe, Hal Jordan Green Lantern. And and you see him on screen, and you know, like, wow, you know, this is, I'm a part of this on some level because it's my uncle. Uh, that was really, I thought, just a, another example of realistic writing in these books, where it was just a great sequence that played out, two brothers really having a hug out over uh, things that the, the one brother's not, clearly not going to understand 100% but has to support and there's something to that you know the, this idea that we have to it's at a certain point support each other and just realize wow I don't understand what he's doing completely but I've got to rally behind him because you know this is my brother this is my you know we're, we're close and I got to back his play there even though in my walk of life in my situation I can't 100% relate. It was an interesting play that went there. I loved how that whole sequence, it was, a, it was a short but sweet sequence of events that I completely get. Go ahead. What were you, where, where are you going to uh, go with this? Words, words cannot accurately describe the emotions that you, you go through when you're sitting there thinking, okay, my brother's going to war. Yeah. He may die. And, you know, it's my family... <laughs> We've dealt with this firsthand, and there's you can't I can't explain it. I don't have the words for it, but these sequences were absolutely wonderful in relaying just a fabric of the emotion you go through. Because it's you know, it, you know, <laughs> just thinking about it. My brother's retired now. He's safe. He's never gonna go back there. You know, he's never gonna be in a situation where he may die. You know, fighting and you know, and you know, doing you know, doing his duty. But I still know people who are right now, you know, in harm's way. You know, and it's 
it's a tough thing to look at. It's a tough thing to think about. And, you know, it's, you get to those points where you, you don't want to think about it, but you don't want, you, you can't forget what they're doing. You can't forget what they're doing, but it's, it's a tough emotional roller coaster that you're on. And, you know, especially with the little kids where, you know, they, if you, you know, you hear about the death, you hear about tragedy, you hear about everything. And, but it's still, it's, it's hard to explain and hard to deal with when it's, you know, when it's your uncle, when it's your brother. It's not just, uh, you know, just a name or a face on a TV. It's, it's your blood. It's your family. It's, you know, that person that, you know, you, you, you hung out with when you were a kid and you played, you know, Star Wars with. And it's, you know, and <laughs> it's, it's tough. And yeah, I I love these sequences because yeah. I did get that emotion. I did get that emotion from Hal, and I got from his brother, and you know, and I every, and the kids. Wait, and the kids. Yeah, I thought the kids, the kids were man. that was it's, the kids were well handled too, because they don't understand it in a different way. You know what I mean? That's very honest and human. You know, they're like yeah. stay, Uncle Hal, please. You know, because there's a, there's clearly a relationship there, and he clearly cares about them too. Just just a really interesting, and I thought realistically emotional sequence of events that uh, I, when comics touch on this stuff, that's why wh- people always ask, you know, well, why are you so into these characters or why do you get so into the comics or things like that? Because when you put reality and mix it in with the fantastic, there's, there's a connectability there that is really deep and rich. It's an interesting balance that you have to skirt because, yeah, you want those kick buck heck gas yeah, stories where you're seeing just amazing things that could never possibly happen in a million years. But spewed into that, you want that connectability to believe these are real people that live in a living, thriving world that is very similar to our own. And you need moments like this to ground you in that. If you don't have them, the disconnect remains. When you have them, there's a connection that's deep that keeps you coming back issue after issue uh, during the roller coaster ride that is serialized storytelling. You know, you, you jump from creative team to creative team. A lot of times you have, you're lucky when you have amazing runs that, it, you know, really connect you deeply with a character. But then sometimes you'll hit an occasional run here and there where for you, it's, you know, the roller coaster has gone downhill and you're kind of in this uh, middle ground where it's like, ah, oh, these are good stories, but I'm not just, I'm not having those heck yeah moments like I had previously. And sometimes it's everything that you had previously that keeps you reading for a little bit until another creative team comes on and, you know, gives you that, reinvigorates you. Or sometimes you drop that title for a little bit during that, you know, low point for you run and you come back on when somebody new jumps on the book. But what keeps you coming back for more, whatever that looks like, whether you stay the whole time or, you know, you come back and revisit later. It's the connection that you get in these moments. That would make you, that's what makes you love that character. That's why when those characters go to the big screen, you root for them to have great moments because you want everybody else to understand why you like them the way that you do. It's cool. We continue the St. Walker storyline in this one, which I really enjoyed. But besides that, the investigation sequence to me, when Hal comes back, and Hal kind of realizing I need to rework things. I need to change the way that I operate. It can't be all about me charging out in the front the way that I used to. It looks cool and all, and I'm the fighter pilot that's in there used to having those rings, you know, gunslinging moments that you get inside the pilot seat. I can't keep operating this way, though, when my responsibilities are much larger than it being just about me having those moments, those heroic moments. I've got to think about others and how decisions affect them. He put, starts putting together a team that are his advisors. And I loved his rationale for choosing each one, that each one served a purpose, including the newbie. Yep. You know, that was, to me, I thought, just a brilliant sequence of events. Uh, because I think in any organization, whether you're dealing with a business or you're dealing with a military or a police or, or any, anything where there's a leadership, you know, at education, we, we have... Uh, you know, teams of people that are put together. And uh, when you've got one person who's taking it all on themselves, you have moments where you're not going to be able to consider everybody in every possible situation. Hal doing this is a first step towards him evolving. And I like that. 
And he definitely needed to do this because, you know, Hal is a really good uh, ring slinger, but as the head leader, he was making mistake after mistake. It just it, He was stumbling and he needs, you know, just the support structure. First thing you do with, you know, you need an established chain of command. You need to establish people who, you know, other opinions. And it's, you know, he, it's seeing him change, seeing him go through this was awesome. And I like the fact that, Two sixes on the team, but she still doesn't have the full fledged Green Lantern logo yet. She's mm. still a rookie. You know, they're not a saying just because we're promoting, we're putting you on this inner council, we're promoting you. No, she still has to earn her symbol with time and just with, you know, just usage and whatnot and go through the process. But along the way, she does have something that brings to the, you know, that will help Hal with the decisioning and with the governing and the future of the Lantern. So he recognizes where, you know, what he can do. Plus, he got the recommendation from Jon Stewart. He trusts John. He knows John could, you know, John could have very easily filled her role, but he, John wasn't the right person for the job. It was her. So it's great to see him do that and where he went with this, uh, this council or, you know, you know I don't know what you're going to call that yet. Well, and the other thing is, too, you run into a real danger if you only put the Earth Lanterns on this. So if you're half your, if you and another one of your council people, when they've got four, then the whole group, are both Earth Lanterns, how are you going to make decisions that globally affect everybody of so many different races and species and, you know, from planets? And you've got to put together a team that's representative of the people that you are making decisions for and guiding. And putting this squad together makes perfect sense the way that he did. Got John's recommendation, which he, he we saw in previous issues, where he and John Hay came to verbal blows. It was something where Hal really had to realize the value of John as a check and balance. So he put somebody in this squad, just like you're mentioning, who gives that, who brings that to the table and analyzes it in a way that Hal will not. So you've got the advantage of having that John Stewart style thinking while being able to keep him in his role with the core and where you also need him as a leader in the field. It's just brilliant. It's a brilliant yeah. move. I really loved how this was written because I was fascinated at seeing this put together. Another example of adding a little reality to the idea that he's leader of the core now. And, you know, I like how going on these away missions, mm -hmm. you know, you think about just the Star Trek thing where Picard never wouldn't go on away missions, but number one, you know, Riker always went instead because Picard's position was too important and yada yada and how they did that. But you go back to the er early version where Kirk always led the away missions. Kirk was always up front. I kind of like that leadership style. I like that Hal is going down to the planet and Hal is that out in front and you know throwing down. Granted, it doesn't completely work a lot of times because you can have issues where if your chain of command is in the very front, it throws things back in the rear where everything else is happening. But now that he has established, you know, a somewhat of a council, him out there isn't going to weaken the the structure back on uh, Mogo. But I like how Kilowog calls him on it. Yeah, and he has to say, you know, this is I, I'm changing a little each At a time. <laughs> yeah, and and I thought that was an honest answer because it addresses both of what you're saying. I'm a big fan of the Kirk. Um, Star Trek, and I'm also a big fan of the Picard Star Trek. I actually liked the distinction between the two in their leadership style. I thought they were both very valid leaders on those shows, but one is more of a, I'm leading by example, I'm going out into the field. Picard's leading by common sense and putting together great teams and, and trusting in his second-in-command who really is better suited for those missions than he is, and recognizing that, hey, my going down there is not the same thing as sending him down. Yet, where there's something that requires more diplomacy, Picard would go. Yeah. And it's just recognizing the strength of yourself and the strengths of your people. And also recognizing the weaknesses and count countering them by choosing the right people to fill those gaps. It's great stuff. And, and you're right. There's a validity to this right here. It's great space opera. The best of Star Trek is. Yeah, and it's funny. Calling this a space opera is a definite neat style to what is the Green Lantern books. Again, we kept talking about how the grooviness 
of the Green Lantern Corps is the fact that you have all these different creatures. You have all these different entities and beings, and they're all brought together for the same common good of you know, doing what's right. And it's the core. And, you know, so you get, you know, as I said before, we're getting more of the core from this, but we are still seeing some really cool, you know, Hal Jordan moments. We are deaf. He is up front and center, the main character of the Green Lantern title, but he's not alone. And yeah. it's, I'd love seeing this, you know, where it goes, you know, how the, um, how we go from point A to point B. It's not. It's never what exactly what I'm thinking. Because I love the fact they grab the uh, the anti uh, the the devices that you know the anti uh, the green devices that are can actually cut through the Green Lantern you know shielding and can actually do green damage can actually hurt the core. You know they snatch it. Well, the bad guys. Okay, fine. You want to take them? Activate. So it wasn't even as simple, as simple as we grabbed them, huh? We won. No, you didn't because they just released them on you. So, bam, now you're fighting this. Well, you got to take out this remote. Well, smash it. I eh, got a better way of doing it. And you got this other lantern, the, you know, the fire lantern, who um, I don't know exactly what his name is, but he's being of pure energy, absorbs into the remote, triggers it, and turns it off. Boom. Done. Completely different way of handling it, not just to smash the remote. He actually deactivates the devices. I thought that was a really cool way to handle this whole sequence where you got Hal doing Hal being cool, but it's not just Hal who saves the day. It's this other lantern. Goran's son. Goran's son? Yeah. Cool. Yeah, because he says, uh, Goran's son, what are you doing? Goran's son is the uh, the lantern that does that. And I didn't... I because it was addressed in the issue, that's the only reason why I know. Um, I'm with you. I didn't really know who the Lantern was until I, I saw that panel, and that was what drew it for me. Uh, it, it goes back to what we were saying earlier. Even, like, if if it's four issues from now that we see Goran's son again, I might not remember that it's Goran's son. Uh, but I like that I will recognize that I know who this Lantern is from this storyline. If they use him enough, I'm going to know it's Goran's son. Uh, your Vath reference earlier is a great example of that's one of the lanterns that I really attached onto in the Green Lantern core book. So I know who Vath is. Yeah. Uh, when you when you attach onto certain ones and you see them again, you have a, a relationship with them. And I like that. It's okay. I don't need to know everybody on the team. It's a, it's a large squad. Uh, I like that there's people I'm starting to recognize more and more, and I'm getting to know them the more that they're used. And there should be ones that are reoccurring characters that I recognize that I'm not going to know because of uh, just who they are. Hal's having to deal with this planet in the way that he did is interesting. You've got a diplomacy here. Uh, These are people that were crafting weapons against the Green Lantern Corps because of the fact that we used to believe in you, used to be your supporters, but now you're like basically eating away the energy force of our universe. And how can we support you? So the... Durland mission was very successful in ridding the Green Lantern Corps of some major allies and turning them into conspirators with others because they don't really have much choice because they believe that the Green Lantern Corps are tyrants now. Yeah, and it's interesting that what are they going to do? Arrest an entire planet. Yeah. You know, they had to, they took, you know, some of them in as prisoners. The rele- the rest they released, but then they went and leveled the plant, the factory that was making the devices. And now they're right in the heart of that, you know, sector. And that's going to be an interesting, you know, again, it's a interesting diplomacy tactic where, in a way, they look and appear as if they are the tyrants they're being accused of, except they're not conquering the people. Their presence is there to protect themselves and to maybe quell the violence, but they're not trying to conquer. And hopefully, Hal's hoping for the long play where he can maybe win their, you know, win some hearts and minds back and actually make them realize, hey, we're not trying to destroy the universe. We're trying to save it. You know, this is, you know, what's going on. And it's going to be an interesting diplomatic diplomatic, uh, mission he's on. And you think about just what we're currently seeing, current politics around the world, where it's not just a simple, you know, this this group is bad, go take them out, everyone's safe. No, there's a lot of touches of grace to politics, to war, to violence in various parts of this planet. Yeah, I agree with you. That's, to me... 
the diplomatic – that's where it becomes more space opera for me. I like seeing that stuff that just fleshes things out, adds a whole new little wrinkle to the whole thing. Star Trek had a lot of that and, uh, you know, along with some great action away team missions and, you know, all the, the right beats are there. And understanding how you connect the Green Lantern books to great space opera I think is really important. Uh, the Durland spy still hiding on, on Mogo. And us seeing, you know, what we saw at the beginning. I can't wait to see what those vials mean for this particular spy. Uh, you know, it's um, it's something that I'm, I'm I want to go back and read some of these issues because I remember them addressing these vials. I've seen them before, and I'm not going to lie, I don't quite remember what the premise was behind them, but I, I seem to remember them being something incredibly necessary to the Durlins. And if somebody knows out there, please feel free to call in or, or you know, write into the show or post it on our Facebook group uh, what's going on with those. Because I'm going to go back and reread some issues because I feel like there's something that I read before that I'm not quite remembering at the moment. And I was thinking, and I'm not sure if this is just remembering from something or whatnot, but I was thinking it was something to do with like a DNA sampling. It was to to allow them to fool Mogo and to actually hide. And instead of being a Durlan on Mogo, they are that creature on Mogo. And so to Mogo, it would just look like it's the creature itself, I think is what I, I mean, I'm remembering. And maybe it's just something that's popping in my head and I, I, I don't remember right now, but that's what, that's how I took that whole sequence to mean. Now that's the cook, right? Yeah. The one that's uh, posing as that character. Right. Which I really liked, so I don't know. Yeah, because he was hiding when they rec- saw his face and recognized him, so he needed to hide in other shapes. He couldn't be the cook anymore because they knew what the cook looked like. Yeah, yeah. So it's, I don't know, I'm, I'm really enjoying this story. I love that I care about what's going on with things like the vials and this whole Durlin storyline. I like that there's more than one thing going on. I was a big fan of, of Valiant's uh, Rye and Magnus when they used to uh, tie in with each other. And they did space opera so well over there. And Tony Bedard was one of the writers over there at the time. And I I think that these creators right now have really grasped the best of what works with space opera in the Green Lantern books. I just just want to see more. It's cool. Look at those strange little beetles. They look great neutron. And our next discussion will be Superman Wonder Woman number six. The writer is Charles Soule with pencils by Tony S. Daniel, with uh, Bat and Sandu Flory on inks, Tome Mori, and that's T-O-M-E-U-M-O-R-E on colors, Carlos M. Manguel on letters, with Daniel and Bat on cover, RC Studios, Robot Chicken for the Robot Chicken variant cover, with uh, Ricky Purity as the associate editor, Eddie Braganza as group editor. And, of course, Superman was created by Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster in special arrangements with the Jerry Siegel family. And Wonder Woman was created by William Malton Marston. And I always want to butcher his name, and I feel bad doing that because, again, it's Wonder Woman. And I, I don't want to disrespect any creators, but there's certain creators you just you can't, you can't you know, insult. <laughs> well, I think one of the points why we read the creative teams, even though... You know, the, there's clearly from both of us name butchery on it is because of what you're saying. First of all, I like to get to know the creators' names and associate them with their material. And I don't want it to just be about the characters. I want to recognize in my mind who the people are that have created this material because I just think that's really uh, something of value. I'm taking a look at this book in particular. You know, when um, Superman Batman came out years ago, it was a critically acclaimed series because of the fact that it was really addressing the relationship between these two characters and their relationship with the universe as a whole. This book is doing that with Superman and Wonder Woman. And it's so unique because of the fact that we've got a Superman and Wonder Woman who are dating. And now it's public knowledge that they're dating. Not just public knowledge, governments know about this. And they've got to address the fact that, oh my gosh, (laughs) these two powers are together. What happens if the two of them band together and decide to take over everything? Your your fears come to fruition. Batman acknowledges that with them, and it's something they have to deal with. And the two of them have to address throughout this issue, Superman especially, concerns about, is this really better for us? 
do we operate better like this with the emotion being tied to it instead of being teammates? Uh, there's a different relationship to being a couple when you're doing this than to being friends and teammates. That that path changes. The problem is once the re- once the feelings start, if they broke up now, it wouldn't change the problem if it was a problem. Her answer, I think, is really good. You know, as far as saying, you know, hey, if I thought this was an issue, we wouldn't be together. Uh, you know, there's there's a point to playing this and using this to our advantage if we acknowledge it and learn how to in a healthy manner, deal with anything that's rising along the way. She has concerns, too, which we've seen throughout this series, which I've loved. We're six issues in, and I've really loved how this series is written uh, because of the fact that it's not just about the two of them fighting Doomsday and then fighting along with uh, you know Zod and Feora and, and uh, Apollo and all the things that we're seeing in this. It's not about that only. It's about how the two of them react to the world. It's about how the world reacts to them and how they deal with it, including their teammates, and how they emotionally feel about that. I feel like we're really getting to know a ton about both characters in this series. Arguably, and this isn't, I want to be very careful with this, arguably in a way that we aren't necessarily getting to know them in their own series because we're getting to see them through the lens of the other person in a way that you don't necessarily always have time to explore in their series. So that's not a knock on what the creative teams are doing in the Superman books or in Wonder Woman because uh, the brilliant books, but Wonder Woman, I mean, is uh, just a terrific run right now. So it's not a knock, but I think we're seeing something here from the two of them because these characters mean so much to us in how they're reacting with each other. I don't know if you're feeling that way. I feel like we're really getting to know them in this book, particularly as we've gotten this whole Kryptonian saga going on right now. I never thought I would say this, but I am actually happy that Superman and Lois aren't together. I always said, oh, yeah, it'd be an interesting story. But this series has yeah. actually made me happy that they made the choice not to have those two together. You know, when we, they first started talking about this relationship, I was like, oh, that'd be interesting. That'd be kind of neat and you know, kind of curious. And eventually I want to see Lois and Superman together. Now I'm sitting here going, you know, I don't need it. I've got a great, you know, superhero relationship. I've got a great character growth and just character exploration that I always loved about the Lois and Clark relationship. I don't need it. And I've got this, but there's even more places they can go with this. And I am just so going, wow, this is awesome. This is just a neat, neat part of the story and where it goes through because because of the fact that it is Superman and Wonder Woman together. It is these two powerful beings that what if they have a breakup? What if they have a fight? Because we saw in the issue right before this, these two had kind of a rough words with each other. Diana went to Paradise Island, which was some great sequences Mm -hmm. of her on the island. And then Clark was by himself, and that's when Zod sprung the trap. Well, released himself from the containers and released everything and then pulled Feora out and just all this massive stuff that happened because those two kind of had a little tiff and Bruce started calling him on it going, what, what do you mean you two? What's going on? It just everything that Bruce was afraid of is happening and you get that brief moment, but these two are heroes. They do work together. They did pull it through, and you get some cool stuff in the end of the last issue, and then this issue going forward with them on the same page, them being each other's shelter in the storm. I loved that line. Yeah, and and really using the resources at the disposal of both throughout this, uh, there being a benefit to the fact that both of them, while they're very powerful and and two of the most powerful characters in the DC universe. They also have different skill sets and different backgrounds and different resources pulling into magic resources that Wonder Woman has access to and recognizing that these are going to be things that are going to help them fight against Kryptonians. Superman knowing his own weakness uh, was great. I loved the costumes that were, because again, we're not just putting some flashy costume on Superman and Wonder Woman. We are putting together costumes that have a tactical benefit. Using the chariot, tactical benefit. Giving the element of surprise that we're seeing, you know, Superman doesn't have the military background, so what do we do? We use Wonder Woman's skill set there. Yeah. How awesome. 
those are the armor that they put on because at first like oh okay that's kind of neat i was thinking magic armor protect them from the punches and stuff that's out i never thought where it was going to go from there how those were actually a weapon and they were storing the kinetic energy of the punches to be released later on i thought that was an absolute just awesome just again usage as you said of their two individual resources but just in that fight where you look from the last issue to the current issue, Zod tells Fiora, hey, go after the woman. Clark will be distracted. You know, kal will be distracted to protect her. This fight, however, completely different thing because Diana is like, ha, you kind of threw off. He knew I could protect myself. Your plan won't work. And I love just that fact that from one issue just to this issue, we've seen a growth of these characters. We've seen them get accustomed to each other fighting and how they're going to go out you know, and how they're going to deal with this. This was some great stuff. Wait, wait, wait. And I love this line. You got to go to the one before that. It's not jewelry, nor all I bring. You are clearly a soldier. You trained for war. But I was trained by war. <laughs> <laughs> Just what, and I know she adds himself out there, but when we hit that point where I was trained by war, what a powerful, like, (laughs) how do you argue with that? Because it's true. (laughs) Oh, she's awesome. And it is that, you know, one of the things that makes Wonder Woman so cool in this universe, and even in the past universes, she is a warrior. Mm -hmm. This is an Amazon. This is somebody who knows how to throw down. And the argument of who is faster, Superman or Wonder Woman, well, and a straight speed, you know, figure, just a, a physical ra- uh, race. Yeah, Superman's faster in combat. No, because Diana is fighting from muscle memory. Diana is just this is pure training. This is just second nature to her. You throw the punch, she's already blocking and striking and getting ready for the next counter fight. Why? Because that's her training. That's her discipline. And, you know, past issues in this series, we've seen her do some more training. We've seen her just, you know, kind of flex the training muscle. And you can see exactly how tough Diana is. And it's great to see her throwing down with, you know, two Kryptonians. And she can just pull all punches out. And she's doing headbutts and breaking noses and blood is splattering. And this is a Kryptonian she's doing it to. Part of it is her strength. Part of it is the fact that everything on her is magical, which is a weakness to Kryptonians. I loved seeing this stuff, man. Yeah, it's this is a series that has not let up. It's been we're six issues in, and it's every single issue. First of all, the art team, kudos. Uh, It's just a beautiful, beautiful book. Really, really love this. The writing has just been spot on. I mean, it's it ties in so directly with what's going on in Superman's book with Wonder Woman's book. But I, I as I said before, I would have gone to live and say I really think the character growth of both in this series has just been stellar, and uh, it's something to be valued. If you're a fan of either character, you should be reading this series. And uh, I, I want to actually throw a shout out to in general, though. I don't know. You, you, we've talked on the show before how. People sometimes are reluctant, um, you know, males are reluctant to pick up a female character's book sometimes because that's a girl and a girly book or something like that. If you like this series and you like Wonder Woman and this and you're not reading Wonder Woman's book, you got to pick that up. It's good. It's killer stuff. Uh, I'm actually sad that uh, eventually um, it's been announced that the creative team is going to be leaving. I'm going to be curious to see who they replace them with. Oh, that's gonna be a tough one because I've I've digged where they're going with it. I do so. too. Yo, man, it's got to be a very very careful strategy who you get to uh, replace them. They, they've got the the current. There's a there's an arc that's coming that is going to be their last arc. You know, so we're gonna get another arc from them. But oof, I, I just, yeah, I know the Wonder Woman is just an outstanding character, and we're getting to see some really. You know, at the end of the old 52, we had that you know Amazonian princess, the ambassador, the warrior, just this really powerful you know female form that just she was this great hero, but she was also this great female hero. It wasn't just a female hero; she was a true hero. And when she first, when the new 52 first started off. You know, she had, you know, she was a little rough around the edges. She didn't, you know, she was trying to do good and she was trying to do right, but it wasn't as clean cut as she was at the end of the uh, the last universe. We're now seeing, you know, I'm now seeing that same type of clear cut, just that wonderful hero, 
And I'm really it's it's been a process that as the Wonder Woman title has gone on, I've really started enjoying it, you know, enjoying her even more and more. And then adding the Superman Wonder Woman title to the mix was something I was like, okay, this should be interesting for the relationship, but. These are some great hero stories as well, as well as these these human moments between these two and the reactions of everybody around it. And then you get some great, beautiful artwork. You know, I'm I'm a big fan of Tony Daniels' work. And just the one page I gotta say I loved was where it was the heavy, shadowy focus. Yeah, yeah, and you yeah, can yeah. tell which one was Clark by the cape, which one was Zod. You can see which one's Diana, which one's Fiora. And you, it's just a really cool moment where you didn't get all the etchings and the details of the face, which is stuff I usually really like. But it was this, a beautiful artistic style just showing massive volleys of punches and damages and blood splatter and just on both sides, give and take. And I was like, man, that's a cool page to have in the middle of this book. I, I really, really dig uh, just the, the art choice there. And that led to you know just the sense of a uh, vast amount of blows and, ex- and exchanges, which leads to a much more powerful sequence when they finally do unleash it, because that was beautiful. And seeing that the gods were watching this, I like that reminder that we're dealing with gods that uh, throughout media, whenever we've seen you know uh, Zeus and Apollo and, and that whole ilk, you usually see them standing by some form of pool watching everybody. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a big Clash of the Titans fan, you know, so I just got that kind of you know vibe from the whole thing. And, and this kind of, this guy did this to me, meaning Superman, you know. This is why the Kryptonians recovered so fast, because I'm the god of the sun. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and okay, you use that against me, but you got to remember, uh, what happens if I decide to direct the focus of it? And your enemies are sponges just like you. Well, okay, you want to dance? Let's dance. I adored that sequence. How cool was that? Oh, God, yeah. And just seeing them supercharged, and you're just like, oh, this is not going to be good. And even Clark, that they recognize, go, try to bring the league. I'll hold them as long as I can. You know, they knew right then and there, this is it. This is the end. <laughs> Them opening up the gateway and trying to bring out the war world, and the two of them just having to realize, uh-oh, there's only one chance right here. We've got to risk sacrificing ourselves to make this sequence. And Clark, for the first time, says to Diana, I love you. Yeah. And, and, and you know, just her smirk, because we saw her journey into all that. You know, of course you do. And the two of them grabbing the sword, and it sets off a chain reaction. They don't know if they're going to survive. Was just absolutely brilliant. And yeah. I love that he used his cape to shield her. Yeah, I, it, she's got to be okay. Come on, you know. Now he's hurting pretty bad because he's split an atom, which is never a good thing. But you know, what does that do to the gateway? What does that do to War World? What does that do to Zod? What does that do to the planet? You think about it. You detonate a nuclear bomb. It's granted it was an old uh, testing facility, so it was abandoned, and it's in the middle of the South Pacific. So hopefully you're going to have minimal civilian casualties, yeah. but there's going to be an effect on everybody. And again, this is going to be something that's going to play out because these two are in heavy spotlight of everybody now. Sure. So... We now have this massive nuclear explosion detonated by them. Now, they can say all they want. We did it to save the world. We did it to stop this this, uh, war world from coming in. But how are they going to get the message out? Who's going to believe them? How's the government going to react to the fact that Clark was able to do this? Are they worried? Can he do this again? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's great points that you're making right there. That's one of the things that I really love about this series is, Everything you just said is 110% true. Uh, so what, what does that look like for these characters? I don't know. I, I, that's the part I'm endlessly fascinated by. And they left us in a really great cliffhanger. And the great part about that is this series hasn't felt the need to rush what you're talking about. They've explored those things at a speed that I think is appropriate for us to really get, a, get to know that. Yeah, it's, this has been a good pace for it. You know, we're at, you know, issue six, and it's just, again, it's the, the relationship has grown and developed, and I'm comfortable with it. And I, I did like the sort of Han Solo-esque, you know, comment of, of course you do. 
you know, it's, you know, kind of had that same type of, you know, just vibe to it. And I was like, that's kind of neat that she would do that. And you get, again, nice, cool moments that don't take away from the seriousness of what they're about to do. Hey, I agreed. That's that's one of the keys as well. Um, I, I didn't at any point in time feel that it was um, unlike the characters, which I think is uh, a pretty cool thing about it. Now I can get out of here. Hey, this is Jack, and here's the deal. Um, first off, I uh, love the show there, Sean and Jim, and I have definitely something to rage about. I am loving Kara with the Red Ring. That is fantastic. Now, I know it's a little old. I'm a little behind because I had a lot to do at work recently. And I got a trip to Israel coming up, so um, I didn't get a chance to read everything, but I read like two or three issues with her in that red ring now. And man, that is awesome. Guy Gardner's team of Red Lanterns went from very small, but funky to very powerful with Kara holding a ring. And I have no idea how they're eventually going to get that ring away from her. Um, but wow, I just love that story. So anyway, that's what I wanted to raise about, but then I had another question for you. Okay. Godzilla is one of my favorite uh, sci-fi franchises, and they're about to get, he's going to get a prequel uh, comic from DC, and I'm hoping that uh, DC will pick up the license, even though I totally love what IDW did with it. And I started to think, what about other sci-fi franchises? We know that Star Wars is, uh, Marvel is going to Dark Horse. I mean, um, Star Wars is going to Marvel from Dark Horse. Are there any sci-fi franchises you guys think DC should go for? Um, maybe Star Trek? I mean, I loved it when they had Star Trek. How about uh, the Transformers? Maybe Harry Potter? I don't even think Harry Potter has a comic company. Is there any franchise out there or license out there you think uh, you would like to see DC pick up? And who maybe write it, you know? Anyway, uh, thanks a lot. Talk to you later. Bye. I'm a big fan of sci-fi franchises like um, Dark Horse let's use them as an example like their Buffy stuff I'm a big fan of because they're doing like continuing seasons of the show after the fact and I like prequels I like sequels like that where it's a continuation of the product uh, instead of uh, side stories that you're trying to jam into material that already exists does that make sense you know sometimes they try to fit uh, sometimes episode content in between television episodes that sometimes like, how did you get that in there? Yeah. Um, although I say that, and I'm a fan of uh, big finish does audios for uh, doctor who, and they plug those in between episodes as a way to do new audio content with those doctors and those companions. And that works really well to me. It, it always goes back to one thing and actually big finish is a great example for this. My favorite big finish audios are the ones that just have stellar writing that match the performances of the people in the audios. Uh, the same thing goes on with the best stuff from the sci-fi stuff from Dark Horse. The IDW Star Trek stuff that they're doing right now is really, really fantastic. And Dynamite is, I'm excited for this. I haven't read it yet. Uh, I was a big $6 million man fan growing up. They just released uh, season six, issue number one from Dynamite. And I, I'm anxious to read that to read a continuation of the $6 million man television series there. So stuff like that is great. I think the key is you can oversaturate the market with sci-fi for the sake of throwing out sci-fi. If you're going to do it, what series would I like? Ah, there's so many of them that are really good that I grew up with that I would love to see more of. Uh, I'm a big fan of the Kurt Tomorrow People television series. I loved the British version of it. I would love to see a continuation of the British version of it in comic book form if the you know if they're not going to do um they did audios of it for a while but if they're not going to do any more of that I would love to see a continuation of that in comic book form. I don't you know you you know like Stargate and stuff like that uh you know I'd like to I don't know if there is a Stargate comic right now. Um but I, I wouldn't mind seeing stuff like that if there is and actually tell me if there is cuz I'd love to read it. I know they've had some stuff, but they I don't have. think there's anything outgo on, ongoing or current out there for Stargate. Yeah, Dark Horse has been, to me, a, a host of it always. You know, the Terminator franchise, they've continued and done very well. Jamal Eigel's actually doing the artwork on the current one, and I'm really digging it. 
Um, there's a mini series out right now. Um, they always did uh, that, Aliens, Predator, stuff like that for sci-fi. Uh, I don't have something that's like burning in my head where I'm like, it's got to be this. Uh, it's more a lot of times uh, creative teams, creative directions, uh, choosing sometimes to continue something that like it ended and I'd like to see more of it. That always works. Like I'm, I'm loving uh, D, just going to DCN. Their Smallville digital comic. I'm loving because it continued the series from its ending point, and I'm really liking what they're doing with that. It's it's great material. Batman sixty six being continued is a great thing. Um, they're starting to do more with television fram- franchises. Like uh, they got Vampire Diaries. I've been getting those digitally just because I, you know, for the sake of the show, I'd like to comment on it. Um, but I haven't had a chance to read that yet. I've got the issues though. And uh, the digital ones, so I'd like to read those. But I don't know. I mean, um, is there anything you're thinking of? Like that, there's a sci-fi series that you were particularly close to. V DC had that license for a while. I'd love to see them uh, bring back V because I loved V. The only thing that pops in my head, two things. Mm -hmm. One is Doctor Who, and I would say do a Doctor Who of the early Doctors Mm -hmm. that people my age, you know, and people who didn't well i'm not even saying people my age people with my experience who are late into the doctor who wouldn't know who these doctors are start doing some of those stories and introduce us to these classic iconic doctors but introduce us to them in the comic book format i think that would be a neat way to handle doctor who go back go old school doctor who pull up some of these classic doctor who stories with you know the doctor who had the big the the who had the big scarf, you know that guy. I, I always forget his name. And Tom I'm, Baker. Thank you. They you know, they released the from IDW. They did classic Doctor Who as a series for a while, and it just ended recently. And oh, good. Uh, I didn't know that IDW's um, lost the license. The license is now going to I forget the name of the company, but they're going to be doing a a tenth Doctor book, an eleventh Doctor book, which would be the Matt Smith Doctor. And they're also going to, when he takes over, they're going to do a Peter Capaldi Doctor Who book. So they're going to do three oh, of them. Cool. Uh, so we're going to get those. But they aren't, I haven't heard anything about them doing what you're mentioning, which I would really like, a classic Doctor book. Yeah. Now, would you do that? Like, as, um, would you, How would you do that? Would you pick one of those Doctors to do it with? Or would you do like arcs that rotate with I would do doctors? arcs rotating. Okay. And I would say, you know, you know, arc, you know, and you would know which doctor it is. And even like in the opening page, you know, Tom Baker, yada, yada, or, you know, the seventh doctor, you know, or, you know, just some yeah, little yeah. bit, you know, to, to give people, you know, and go with uh, the people who know the doctor will be like, hey, this is a great Doctor Who story. The people who know of Doctor Who, but who don't know that particular doctor say, well, here's a way for me to learn about this guy. You know, and even they could even retell some classic you know, BBC stories, you know, and it would be a different medium because it's in the actual paper medium and they could actually have some fun with it. And you get creative teams that are familiar with the, uh, the doctor that are familiar with, you know, just who he is, you know, no pun intended. You know, it's, you have somebody who knows and is comfortable with the doctor and you can get some really neat stuff out of it. And, the other the other sci-fi story that always pops in my head when anybody says, is there anything you would like to see? Serenity. Give me some Firefly, man. I Dark Horse, either... is, Dark Horse is doing it right now as a miniseries. They are? Yeah. Oh, crud. I got to. Okay. There's, well, there's, a, there's a miniseries right, right now. Really? It's good. Okay. It's good, too. <laughs> it's really good. Well, thank you. Yeah. I, see, I got to keep my eye on the other title, on the yeah. other companies. It's, I, well, that's why I mentioned Stargate before earlier, and I said I don't know for sure. I, I try to keep uh, it. And, um, it's, I think it's a good problem. I, I, it's funny because nowadays it's probably one of the reasons why I, I feel sad for people who are crabby about their comics currently. Because if you're not liking something, there's so much product out there and it's great stuff. Like I can't keep up with reading all the stuff that I want to read. And I don't pick up things that like, there's a lot of things I want to read that I don't pick up because I'm like this, I'm, I'm already at my oversaturation of content. And I don't mean that in all as a negative. I like the problem. I like the problem that when I look at the previews catalog, it's a candy store. And there's so much great product out there, but Serenity's, yeah, it's Dark Horse is doing it. And Dark Horse, to me, the Joss Whedon stuff um, needs to stay there 
and I want to see them continue to just deliver great product that they are because they're doing uh, Buffy, Angel and Faith, and they'll do occasional Buffy specials, but they're also doing a Serenity miniseries, which I hope does really well because I really like it, and I'm hoping that we're going to follow up to it because it's really good. Cool. So it's it's neat stuff, and yeah, it's from Dark. Well, the two things I want are out there. All right, I'm happy. <laughs> but see, that's good news, and that's the point when Jack brings up stuff like that. That's why I'm glad when people bring up things. Now, he was asking which licenses do you want DC to have? I don't know that I really ever focus on a comic company, particularly saying I hope that comic company gets a license. Like, the Marvel license for uh, Star Wars is something I'm very concerned about. Um, And let me clarify. You get the right creators on the book and we honor the fact that the Dark Horse stuff has been published. I think that's fantastic. We get creators on books and we ignore the Dark Dark Horse stuff or go out of our way to contradict it. I got an issue with it. I don't think they're going to do that, though. I really, really don't because uh, I've seen recently on the net that um, Disney's been taking a look at Star Wars material and kind of putting it in order according to what they consider to be what's canon and what's not and how do we prioritize what's canon when we're making the movies, for example. And it looks like the expanded universe is something that they are considering as canon as much as they can. And there, there's got to be a disclaimer on there that obviously, you know, if you're going to be doing television shows and movies, you have an opportunity to explore certain content. You don't want to say, well, we can't do this now. But if there's a way when you're doing in a television series to acknowledge a character that occurred in a book and make them a part of that show and somehow you know, keep that expanded universe alive. That's something I want to see when the dark horse stuff goes over to Marvel with star Wars. Um, because there's been so many great creators that have touched on star Wars over the time. I, you know, I threw V out there. Honestly, I love V as a show. I don't know how well it would do as a comic at the moment. Although there seems to be, as long as if it was like classic V, I think it would have a, a fan following. Because that seems to be uh, a lot of the stuff that's doing really well right now are these resurgences of classic television shows where they're continuing them. You know, that seems to, in, mil, in films, you know, where they're, they're continuing them in comic book form. I'd love to see that. Um, not sci-fi, you know, I'd love to see a great Indiana Jones comic. Yeah. That's set very classic, you know, that we don't need a lot of bells and whistles. I want to see indie tomb raiding. Yes. Um, and Gail Simone's Tomb Raider thing is, uh, you know, kind of got me because that's fantastic. Her first issue of that was great. So I'd love to see kind of more of that. Um, but I don't, yeah, I don't have um, anything that's pressing at the moment um, other than I think that should be creator driven. And if they got a great pitch and a great idea, I hope it gets support. I don't know always that licensed properties um, at the big two always work. Because I think they're very niche, you know, fan, and and, um, I think they do better at your Dynamite and IDW and places like that where the numbers are really good for them when they do them, and the production quality is really high. So I kind of like those usually at those companies because they just seem to deliver gangbusters, and and they stick around for a while. Yeah. Which that's always the thing for me. I want it to stick around, especially if it's good creative teams. I want to read more of it. So I don't know. But, uh, you know, if there's some support behind it and they, they put a line together, I'd love to see DC do something with any of those. Jamie calling. Uh, it's been a while since I've talked DC Comics. Um, sadly, mostly because uh, I haven't been, you know, too... I've been pretty down on DC for most for a while now. And uh, my, my selection of DC Comics have dwindled. But... Um, I've read uh, Green Lantern 29, and I really just needed to talk about it because, uh, again, another ish- another series where I felt a little bit waning, but uh, issue 29 really turned me around in a lot of it due to the writing. Um, there are a lot of things in this issue that I've been wanting to see for a really long time, starting with, you know, House family. Uh, I've been wondering what's happened to them. And now we get to see, you know, we get to see how with his brother and his, his, uh, his, his the kids and, uh, and the wife. And um, it's been, that was a really cool moment. I've been, I wanted to see that happen for a while. Um, I'm starting to see how really step up as a leader and realize that he needs help and making this little group of, uh, of lantern, you know, Kilowog and Salak, um, and the other rookie, rookie lantern um, kind of form a group uh, to help him with the leadership role 
was something that I've been waiting to see for a while. And to finally see the lanterns kind of working together, uh, I, I, this is the payoff I've been waiting for because I, I've been, you know, wondering what's been going on with Hal. He, he, it didn't seem like, you know, he could lead. I, I've always known he could lead, but he wasn't doing it in the way that um, I had seen in the past. And I know this is a whole new 52 thing, but uh, this issue really brought this series or back around for me in the positive. And uh, so uh, one more, you know, DC comic I'll be reading. Uh, I'm fortunate not as much as, as I used to. Um, the other thing I want to talk about, mo- mostly because uh, of a lack of the comics I'm reading, uh, is, is the Arrow television show, which I have been loving. Um, I, I think it's it's got everything I've wanted to see in this type of show, um, and I think with uh, Deathstroke now in the present and uh, kind of you know confronting uh, Ollie face to face, and we're going to see. I guess he's, it looks like he might even have a team, uh, even consisting of uh, uh, the Huntress might be on that team, which I'm really looking forward to seeing a Huntress Black Canary uh, SmackDown. That that should be interesting. But uh, this is, season's been really quite amazing and I love what they've been doing and all the different nods to comic book, um, you know, things bringing in like the suicide squad and all this other stuff. It, it's been great. And I just can't wait to see where they're going. And one last thing I want to uh, mention is if people haven't checked out Steve Amell's um, Facebook page, the guy who plays uh, Oliver Queen, check out his Facebook page. He, he is so active on Facebook, whether it's, posting the videos or uh, pictures or updates. Um, he is really a great ambassador to uh, fandom and um, what's coming up in the show. And uh, it's definitely worth checking out. So that's about it guys. Uh, talk to you soon. Bye. So I think issue number 29 is a great example of the point of the new 52. And I think our discussion about Superman, Wonder Woman it falls into the same category. The point is, for everybody to kind of know these characters the way that Jamie does. So when you take a look at a Green Lantern, yeah, Hal hasn't been there yet, but we needed to see Hal evolve into the kind of guy that can be that kind of leader, so everybody understands why. And I think in the sequence where we see him putting together his whole cabinet, so to speak, or you know, his uh, committee, uh, was a great example of him self-evaluating. And I think that's the strength of Hal, the human side of him, where it's not about Hal being perfect, it's about Hal having the maturity to recognize that as a leader stepping up and dealing with it. And I loved that part of the series. So he's right. You know, that's a really good issue that shows, I think, why Hal is a strong leader. There's, there's a point to that. And he's right. Before that, he wasn't leading well, but Hal acknowledges that. And there's, you know, people don't do that. People have a lot of trouble sometimes self-evaluating. I'm one of them. I don't always do a good job of self-evaluating. I like to. Um, and, and I think I'm at my best when I do self-evaluate. But we all have, you know, it's sometimes you just, you want to be right. <laughs> <laughs> and it's sometimes hard to admit to yourself, hey, I'm just, I haven't been right. <laughs> I've made a mistake here. I need to make yeah. some changes here. Yeah. And I'll tell you, after... Reading 29, some of the other earlier missteps of Hal actually read better for me. Sure. Because I know where the character's going. And I need to have these moments, these lapses of judgment, or these mistakes that he's made to make those later points that much better. So it's kind of nice to see within this creative team, this um, development and growth of the character within a couple issues of their title. They're not keeping Hal at a point where I'm like, ah, I'm really not liking this. You know, to the point they they introduce it, they give a couple issues where he's making some mistakes, but then he learns from it and he grows. And we're getting a, a different Hal, a cool Hal, and a Hal I'm like, okay, this makes sense to this guy. This is neat. I'm I'm enjoying this person again. So I, I'm really, uh, I'm really digging and where we're going here, and I'm definitely looking forward to the ride. Yeah, and I agree, totally agree with his comments about Arrow. I think it's just a phenomenal show. And uh, I, I'm excited for the whole Suicide Squad thing that's coming up, more yeah. characters from DC. I like the way that they're carefully introducing characters, and they're not just going for the quick hits. 
the, the characters have reoccurring roles. They're there for a reason. They're being utilized. They have a major impact on the show. You could get crazy and keep like throwing people in for no reason. Um, I, we do have some one-shot villains and stuff like that in there that come in, but then they usually will pop up again later in a way that uh, I just think makes sense for the series. I, I love what they're doing. I just I think uh, they're making a good use of DC lore and making everybody that appears feel like they have value. And uh, it just uh, it's it's a good template for how to do a, a series. And we just, I just got to give once again wonderful credit to and he mentioned Slade Wilson actor uh, Manu Bennett mm-hmm. I believe it's Manu M A N U again I want to make sure it gets full credit to this guy cuz he's absolutely just wonderful as Slade I will always you know think of him as Crixus from the the Spartacus series that was on Stars cuz the undefeated goal you know, just he was an absolute wonderful, powerful character. A lot of the stuff that you're seeing in Slade, you saw in that other character as well. That same strength and just that alpha male presence to him. But you get those some really cool moments where you see the intelligence. And same thing with Slade. We have a very alpha male presence, but we have some cool, tender moments when they're doing the flashback to the island. And then present day with just the the cunning and intelligence of Slade Wilson. This is this was an absolute perfect character a casting in my opinion so you know all all complete you know compliments to uh, all of the arrow cast but i was so excited when he you know was going to be slayed because i love deathstroke and i'm like yeah this is awesome every time he comes on i still cheer and i still yell crixus you know so it's hey, yeah, definitely if, outstanding if a justice league's movie is looking for a deathstroke they got him already Oh, big time, <laughs> big time, man! I yeah. oh god, yes. <laughs> yeah, I graduated him right over to the film. It's like done. I mean, what? <laughs> it's like no brainer. Uh, terrific, terrific job casting that. And you know what the funny part is? You know, we've we've seen Deathstroke be become like a good guy from time to time, or you know, the antihero from time to time. I would gladly see this guy graduate to that as well. Yeah, um, he just. Uh, He's one of those guys that you could see him carrying the character in either direction. You just want to see it. I love his portrayal in the series. Yeah. I want to shout out our show voicemail line. It's 1-440-388-4434 or Dr. Norge on Skype. It's always in our show notes and always available on our website. So uh, please uh, feel free to call in with any of your thoughts uh, about uh, the current state of comics, your feelings about uh, pop culture in general, any of the TV shows relating to DC. We love having you a part of the show, and thank you, Jamie and Jack, for calling into the show. Love having your thoughts a part of it. Great molecules! They're programming the computers for a chain reaction to blow up that atomic pile! I want to once again shout out our Facebook group, uh, which is Raging Bullets. Uh, if you go to Facebook, this is separate from our Facebook page. If you've never been to a Facebook group before, it's a constantly growing community. And really, that's a testament to the quality of the people that are there. It goes so far beyond the show. Uh, people are, like just this week, there was a post that just came through from our friend Jeremy, where he was just posting that solicitations are going to be up this week and just getting excited for that. I just love the geeky conversation that's going on there. People will post updates to their blogs, podcasts conversation about news that's coming out about comics. It's not just DC and nor should it be restricted to that, but I love the fact that, obviously for our DC fans, we love jumping in and talking about all that stuff, but I love that it's grown into like a pop culture community and I just want to thank everyone that's a member of it, so I just want to shout it out and just say that I'm proud to be a member of it and I think it's great. So if you're looking for a safe place to have fun and talk comics, uh, go no further than the Facebook group. And uh, like I said, we have a Facebook page. I also have a personal Facebook page. Please feel free to add me. Uh, um, Besides that, we have Google+. Plus. We have a Raging Bullets page and my own personal page that's over there. We're on Twitter, which it pumps directly from our show website straight to Twitter. So if you're a Twitter fan and like following updates that way, go ahead and do it there. Go to our website, RagingBullets.com. We do regular updates on where the show is headed. Um, I was recently on a podcast. Uh, There's links to that information on there as well. I also want to shout out that podcast. I was on Back to the Bins, and I was with David Price from 11 O'Clock Comics and Paul Spataro, who's uh, the host. And it's at uh, tutufreaks.com, and there's a link right in the show notes, but it's also on our website. And you're going to want to check it out. I had a great time. I got to talk about the first Uncanny X-Men issue I read back from the early uh, 80s. Uh, It was Uncanny X-Men 160, and it was kind of fun to 
put on that hat and talk about my childhood. I was like 11 years old when uh, this thing came out, and uh, it was it was fun to have that com- conversation. And each one of us brought a comic that we wanted to talk about, a single comic from the past, and it was just, it was really really nice. So if uh, if you're a fan of that material, I would definitely recommend checking it out. And uh, just two great people to talk to. Once again, sponsoring this episode is DCBService.com and InStockTrades.com. Over at DCBService.com, I mentioned the Batman Black and White Harley Quinn 2nd Edition Statue. $79.95 regularly, 32% off, only $54.37. Remember that they have deals, 50% and beyond, off of comics. Um, link your digital comics accounts there and earn 5% of those purchases towards your DCB Service order. DCBService.com is your pre-order source. Over at InStockTrades.com, you're going to want to check out Wonder Woman's Hardcover Volume 4, War. $22.99 regularly, 50% off, only eleven forty nine. And I want to thank DCBService.com and their sister site, InStockTrades.com, for continuing to support our show and other podcasts. Please go to our website and click on the handy links and uh, let them know that you are a friend of the show and uh, join up if you haven't had a chance. Or browse around, take a look, see if it's for you. I want to shout out our eight-year anniversary contest. We are celebrating our eight-year show anniversary at the end of March. We would love for you to be a part of it. Jim and I are holding a special Raging Oscars episode at the end of the month, and we've decided to have a little fun limiting ourselves to a set of rules. We will have a set of categories, but are only able to respond in 52 words or less. At the end of each round, we will have 52 seconds for a rebuttal. In discussing the episode, we thought it would be a great chance to have some fun by letting interested listeners join in. We will be giving away three trade paperbacks of choice to winning listeners from show sponsor InStockTrades.com. Rules. In order to participate, send in your entry by calling into our show voicemail line. You can make a category of your choice by shouting out something of note from the past year of comics, but it must be in 52 words or less. You have to play by the same limits we do. Another option would be to call in with something related to the show over the last eight years in 52 words or less. Every voicemail counts as an entry, and so feel free to enter more than once, and winners will be pulled randomly, so everyone will have a chance. Please include your name and email address in the phone call. An alternative is to record your entry and send it to us via email to ragingbullets at me.com with Raging Oscars Contest as the subject heading. Enter as many times as you'd like, as I said, between now and March 23rd. We will announce the winners on our anniversary episode, which will air after that. So it's a great chance for you to be a part of the show. Jim and I are going to be giving those trades away from us to you guys as kind of a thank you for participating. And please feel free to have fun with this. It doesn't have to be a very serious. It can be a serious entry if you're like, oh, I got a passion about this book and I want to do it in 52 or, or this this particular uh, category, and I want to do it in 52 words or less. But if you want to have fun with our show or with comics in general in your entry, you know, laugh it up. Let's have a good time. Uh, the idea is to celebrate on this episode, so we welcome any kind of entry. And feel free to send in a variety of them because uh, we've already started getting some. And I'm very excited for this. So, like I said, March 23rd is the cutoff date. So, and it'll be midnight March 23rd, any time zone, you know, so I'm not going to get crazy about it. The, we want you a part of the show, but uh, that's going to be the cutoff. Good stuff. I'm excited. Our next episode, Jim, we are going to be talking action comics, Aquaman, and we are going to, we had to move it from this episode to the next one, that first contact crossover that's going on in Superman, Batman, or I'm sorry, it's Batman, Superman, and uh, World's Finest. I keep wanting to say Superman, Batman because of the classic series, and World's Finest, though, and I'm really enjoying that, so we're going to talk about that next week. We will see you then. Bye. Space and time, a thousand different lifetimes. Faded for love and loss, and incredibly clear sidelines. Swinging your mace around, such a practical loud look. Helping the JSA and occasionally supporting your own book. Hawk man, hawk man, eagle eyes can't see. Closing in, be they then in guard or Egyptian. 
Working so hard to thwart You and Hawker's mission The odds are not on your side And danger seems to stack up Things would be so much easier If you would just call for backup Hawkman, Hawkman Eagle eyes can't see Your plan And what you do to me Man.